everybody. And here's Mike Brown right on the edge. <laughs> I didn't tell I'm you sorry. I was going to pull you up right away. Boom, right I there. You're talking weird. to the microphone. <laughs> you're like, oh, she's going to be talking for a while. Um, <laughs> hi, guys. Welcome. We've been waiting kind of all for this part two chat with me and Mike here, huh? Huh? You sweet angel babies all in the chat. Thank you for being here. And I also just wanted to say thank you for being here, Mike, because we were just talking about this, that there are not a lot of people currently right now. And I hope this changes very soon, you know, especially with everything coming out on Scientology and so on, all the protesting and everything, that there will be more people that were specifically at cadet bases and in ranch base uh, and that gold base and these executive structures, even from the 80s all the way to the 90s till today. Like, what do you getting the word out of of what we're doing and it could be hard like last the last interview we did uh, I felt so much PTSD and so much adrenaline and I didn't know where it was coming from and I realized I put a lot of I there was a lot of realizing it's been like what two months now right or something since yeah, our last it's been probably just a little bit over two months yeah. yeah. So, and I've learned, we learn and learning and loving. We learn a lot in two months, especially when we're addressing this subject, Scientology, that took over our whole childhood. Um, and, and I also got to look back and reflect on our last interview. Oh, not only were, was there a mic issue, there's a much better mic for both of us now, right? Sounds much better, right? Everybody in the chat, so nobody, nobody's yelling at us yet. And um, also, I do feel that a lot of people and I probably was coming off this way that when we had the last interview that I was like here to condemn you or be like, Mike. And I almost I don't know, probably was. I just didn't realize I was in that mind frame. Like it kind of it yeah. felt like a therapy session where I was going in to address like all of my ranch problems with Mike Brown. And it was just like not the right thing. But well, um on that note, it was a it was a lot because and we had uh, we kind of we were talking backstage and we realized, oh, crap, we're late. We need to just get into this and uh, we'll have the discussions here. Um, see, uh, originally, when I think I had reached out to you and you didn't necessarily want to communicate with me yet, um, my perception of you and your perception of me, they were vastly different. So I just saw you as another kid like me. Uh, though we are 10 years apart in our in our experience going through this whole thing, who had gone through something very similar. And our trauma in my this was in my mind was unique to us. And we both had kind of a shared trauma. So we had a shared bond. So in my mind, you would be considered like a, a loose friend group, just like anyone else um, that had gone through that. What I didn't understand was by the separation of our ages, and then by kind of the hierarchy that's then put in place with the older kids uh, young adults then, you know, kind of raising the younger kids and being responsible for what they're doing or not doing. It put me in a position and I was in a position where you saw me as somebody that was threatening and you had uh, memories of me that were not good memories. And for me, I didn't at first understand that in the least. Um, and I think it was important that we were able to go in and have that conversation. So um, that conversation, how did you feel after it? I was going to even jump in right there. I was going to say, actually, I felt really um, nervous after the conversation, which is such a weird feeling for me to feel in general ever. I felt nervous mm -hmm. like, oh, no, I think I was so abrupt and so harsh with him. And I and I felt like we didn't even get to get to the conversation about how the ranch structure worked and everything. Like I was just so I didn't even realize, I mean, I knew it, but I didn't realize how upset I am. And I mm -hmm. was at the whole ranch, the cadet orgs, the structure, the adults that have been there. It's a lot of anger, but the lot of this anger, I realize, and I even get a little emotional as I say, it comes because there was actually a lot of connection, like in in the most effed up way to say that there was a lot of connection with these kids to the adults because they were our only terminals or outlets to yeah. go to. So it felt, wow, it's coming back a little bit. It felt like I was in trouble for interrupting you, quote unquote, all the time um, without knowing it. But I just felt like, oh, my God, I'm doing this again. And he, and then I was like, well, he's not my authority, so I should feel OK. Like he yelled at me. I can yell at him. 
And it mm-hmm. was it was you and, and when I say he, I'm I'm mixing you in with everybody. It's not just you. So I realize you're one of the only people really even lovingly talking to me about this, but also loving lovingly for both of us, like to clear the air and to clear not with not with Scientology, but to clear the air with actual like uh understanding and talking and for us to have that mm-hmm. first conversation ever after just having a short conversation before I went to my crazy amazing concert it just felt like a lot and I just thought oh I'm so strong and Mike's out now so uh you know he'll get it one people one thing I don't know if people know also is that I got to be really close again with your mom and that felt like again I was I wasn't uh it's like a whole different aspect. It's like, I, f- I feel so much things for you and your wife and your kids now. And I'm just like, wow, he's, he's gone through the mill. Like he's done so many. And I just, you're not mad at me. You were never mad at me at the end of the interview. Like it just felt like I'm not, um, I'm not belittled. Like I was my whole childhood. And I can't imagine what cadets, um, out there are still not talking and are just in and can understand what I'm talking about now. And I'm sure, and you do too. So, so here's Mm -hmm. another, I'm also, I felt like the last interview, I felt like I was also breaking through getting to know you, but still being like, well, I'm, I'm, I understand that you're, I'm, it looks like you're a nice person and you're definitely not the person that I'm, I'm seeing you as. And I also was getting that. I was getting that and I was trying to like take it easy and, but the adrenaline just it's the adrenaline of being like, how is Mike Brown going to fix all of this? Because, mm-hmm. you know, he had a one inkling of creating a very solid part of it all. But it's just like, no, Mike Brown's not going to fix it all. And nor am I like it's going to be all of us talking. And so that yeah. felt really good, even though we it, yeah, it was a weird for me. It felt uncomfortable. I just felt nervous, like I didn't feel good. I felt like, oh, I was in trouble again. And then obviously we get through it. The next day is the next day and I'm at work. So I have no time to deal with anything other than that. And you go to your therapy and all this. And it just feels like, yeah, that's what I said right away. Thank you so much for being here again, because I've also realized that you, you do talk very honestly and open about things. And you also do share that with your friends and things like that. And, and that's how I am with my friends. My friends can be wrong all the time we can have silly little things that were like, Oh yeah, probably a little too much there or whatever it is, but that doesn't, I don't Mm -hmm. give a crap, you know? So that felt, it felt really good now that I have this whole other therapeutic sort of perspective and all the protesting and also feeling great that you did, that you do care to continue talking about it. And that the first episode just happened to be a really shitty first game. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? The first round. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, You asked me, you asked me about it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I wanted to be like, thank you. But I also was like spitting shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it wasn't, you know, so sometimes when you go to the the zoo, some of the, sometimes you get, you know, some poof long on you. It's okay. I can deal with it. Um, but, (laughs) <laughs> no, but uh, sure. I think it was um, honestly, I, I uh, don't have any beef with the last interview. Um, it wasn't easy and I didn't necessarily feel good at the end of it. Um, as you said, you didn't necessarily feel good at the end of it because I think it unearthed so many feelings that I've yeah. repressed for so many years. Uh, so many experiences, both positive and negative in my life. And then it it also, for me, one thing that is very true is... Um, we all have our own stories. And at some point I was that younger kid, um, like you were, and I was then kind of, I had other people in charge of me. And it's sort of like this assembly line as you get older into this organization. That's not a, uh, it really doesn't really give a crap what you want to do with yourself. You're just being moved into uh, that situation, whether you'd like it or not, you're kind of at the behest of the organization. So, um, it was a lot more introspection, like a lot more for me to kind of take in than I thought um, it was going to be. And I'm not going to I'm not going to lie and say I was completely fine and all this sort of stuff. I felt kind of, you know, a little bit depressed about it. But then as the days went on, I'm like, you know what? I think it was important that we talked about this. And I went through and I looked at some of the comments afterwards and um, 
<laughs> some were, you know, some were supportive, some were critical in terms of the way our, our discussion kind of shook out. Like, you know, people didn't think that we were, you know, as fluid as we needed to be. But at the same time, you have two two people that uh, were trying to kind of reminisce about the trauma that happened to us when we were, because I was about 19, 20. Well, I was between the ages. When you knew me there, I was between the ages of about uh, 14 all the way up to about 20 years old in various yeah. different in trouble or, or uh, either a piece of crap in that organization or one of its enforcers. So that's the way mm -hmm. you saw me. And then I just mainly knew you as a young child that then became kind of a, a teenager and that's about the only um but you were one of many other children there um and yeah. uh, it was it was good that we talked about it so at first i was like you know what i don't know if i want to do that again and then after we <laughs> kind of gave it some time i'm, I'm just 100 honest about that and then i realized like hey we probably should like what what is this going to hurt if we talk through this? If we completely, you know, if we keep having conversation, and we're like, you know what, we don't like this. You don't like talking to me. I don't like talking to you. It's too easy for us not to do it. But it's you know, it's an opportunity. Like, hey, let's go ahead and because we both have shared experiences, we might as well do that. And I think that it's a good opportunity, if nothing else. Like, if there's people in this space that want to share what they want to share, everyone's everyone's journey is their own. Everyone's truth is their truth. Uh, and yeah. then I don't, you know, like it, people are allowed to share their views, even if they uh, don't always agree with another person's views kind of in the same space, that's, that's okay. But um, for us, for people that kind of are at different places in our experiences to be able to get, sit down and have a conversation and kind of reconcile, I think is something I want to do. So let's give it a shot. You know, what, what do we have to lose? Yeah, exactly. Nothing. Nothing. And also there were definitely things anyways that were very like uh, healing and like, I don't know what you call it, like just talking about things and just finally being able to talk about it to somebody who isn't trying to make a film documentary or uh, trying to screw it up on the news and get it wrong. Like I was mm -hmm. just like, oh no, here's somebody that was really here. And the, the closest thing I've gotten to that are been like two other cadets who you know, Sam Francis, he's been on a few of my first earlier streams. And like, you know, like there's not that many people, like especially from the Int Ranch. And that to me was my whole childhood. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it really was. But um, so anyways, it just feels it feels like, yeah, I definitely spit a lot at you. But I also feel that you were able to understand where this was coming from. And and I feel like we, we do. Talk at least I tried to very much. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. trying to, I wasn't trying to put baby in the corner. That's for sure. I was willing to hear whatever you had to say about it. Yeah. So. And I thought maybe there was a, I feel like there was a chance that you were going to put baby in the corner. So I think I was like hyped up and ready to be like, no, no, cool. don't put me in any corner. <laughs> like, I have a lot more to say. <laughs> uh, that's no timeouts. <laughs> You're going no to time go outs. In this group. Oh, that's uh Yeah. We both okay, have the, so well, we, we both know we have the potential to re-stimulate one another as we go through this. So we'll just work through it a bit at a time, right? <laughs> exactly. And also, um, I've, I, one of the things, and, and it, it happened after when we weren't obviously on the, on camera on film, but, um, one of the things I realized is that chunk of being afraid to talk, talk to somebody directly from the ranch or about the ranch or about my young childhood feelings. You were one of the only mm -hmm. first people to do that with. So probably, I don't know, not a good, not a good match right away for that, but it is what happens. And now I feel like that, that like that anger is like really gone and I can really just address who did what very clearly instead of just being like, everybody sucks. If you, you know, cause it really does feel like that. Like the planet of Scientology is just horrible. Yeah. So you just feel like anybody I've ever known from it sucks unless I've, you know, been with them outside of that world and they know me and my life and they get it. Like, and right. I only got a little bit of that with you and I still, still have, but like, it's just good. Now it just feels much safer, sure. much better. And nobody's, nobody's, a, nobody's. Yeah. Well, something I wanted to mention just because I'm, I'm in now this, uh, this situation in my life, uh, which I love of having my own kids and having to figure out like, well, one, one thing I know for certain is I know exactly how I don't want to raise my children. So I have a very good example of that. 
um, which was the way we were raised. But I still have a lot of questions. So, you know, I'm trying to read books and understand more about like, and but and then as I see my children kind of going through similar benchmarks that we went through, because my oldest is 11, and I can just think back when I was 11, I look at her and say, oh, hell no. Um, it puts yeah. a lot of things in perspective. But um, one thing that I've found interesting is just from the perspective of brain development, a person's like executive function in their brain, like the, the, the front part of their brain that makes decisions and is there to help them make like, this is a right decision. This is a wrong decision. This is um, handling your impulse control and all that. That doesn't actually formulate fully until they're like 25 or 26 years old. So it, in it, the biology of it is you're almost still a kid or easily unable to regulate yourself to a large degree until you're in your mid twenties. And that's what the science says. And we then had kids managing other kids, both that are unable to regulate very well and how much dysfunction that created, where normally what you're supposed to have biologically is you have this adult that's figured out how to do it called a parent. And that parent is supposed to then help you through these points of dysregulation. And that just completely didn't exist. Um, it wasn't even allowed. That, the connection mm -mm. wasn't allowed. It was considered being off purpose or... Um, like having like like uh i don't even you're know how to call it like dynamic or you're you're, you're, you're loving your mom too much yeah like you're you're too attached like you need another spirit or you need another person to make you feel good like mm -hmm. it's kind of like like it's an out point like it's not a good thing to be so attached to somebody yeah. So all the biological needs and all of the actual parenting things that we, sh that a normal, like actually a uh, healthy relationship should have been with parents and their caregivers, their parent, uh, with the parents and the children, uh, the parents as caregivers, they didn't exist. And then we were kind of given these surrogate caregivers that were really just enforcing certain behaviors that were put in place by the organization and that was the way that we were supposed to be children. Um, mm -hmm. the, there's nothing about that that is that is good. Um, it actually is horrible. So <laughs> looking at it now, I wouldn't put my own kids through that. And I was like, well, um, at least we can talk about it to try to break it all down, to hopefully help ourselves. But then I think what's nice about this SPTV thing is we can put all this stuff out and uh, we can kind of share it all. And then uh, we're providing the no nonsense, unfiltered, like shit into the stick uh, way that all this went down so that other people in the world can hopefully learn from it so they don't fall into the same thing. So hopefully that's something that we can, you know, kind of provide to other people because God forbid other children end up getting involved in this. That would be just horrible. Yeah. Anyway. And and that's like one thing I love about this protesting. I, I'm sure you've been keeping up with it. Like there's a like a bunch of us down on the streets in L.A. And now a a Ron the test Clearwater. Center? Yeah. Oh and my the God, I love those. Center and the and these TikTokers went up and well, they're TikTok or YouTubers now. Um, and they went up to Gold Base and they were there. And then last night, one of the people, Chris, without a hell without a Hellcat. Uh, has mm -hmm. been doing these really good interviews like of just like asking people, old CERC members and, or Scientologists coming in and out of buildings, just like, hey, uh, what's your what do you think, you know, is the greatest thing? What is Scientology you think helped you the most with? And they kind of oh, and OK. And what do you think about the Danny Masterson? Do you think that's a fail? Yeah, once he fair gets him on the hook. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. God. And they do oh, not like him. this. And yeah. And so he got arrested last night or they de detained him last night after they finished the testing center. He went over to the blue, but yeah. And they arrested him. They, or they, they detained him in the car anyways. So stupid. Then streets LA and everybody went out there. But the thing is, is these guys are really stopping child trafficking, human trafficking and financial mm -hmm. destruction of these families happening. Like they're literally stopping them from getting manipulated from right off the bat. So Absolutely. it's just, it just makes so much sense to me that somebody like Chris without a Hellcat would literally get arrested because he went to gold base and he's been going to all this thing. So they are just not acceptable. No. And we could talk about gold base. People think like, oh, it's the old imp property. No, Danny Dunnigan and the structure at currently right now, the gold base, they do. People think like it was kind of boring. No, that was 
completely unacceptable. Like for Scientologists to know that they had to stay inside even for three or four hours so that none of these TikTokers can get any footage whatsoever of anybody walking on the base, which is basically what happened. Like they got the very little footage. Anyways, it's just really cool to see this full circle. Like that's what, by exposing it, families and everybody are not going to want their kids. Just like we don't want, I would like, mm -hmm. just like you said, you're like, I would never, ever, ever have my child even raised in anything that resembled mind control to this degree where they literally have no other choice. Like my kids are programmed now that if we're walking through the grocery store and they walk by the raisins that says ABC mouse on the outside of the raisins, they start turning them on their head so no one can see ABC mouse. Like the kids are just doing that on my own. I'm like, get over here, you little miscreant. But they're like, <laughs> they're like, this is bad. And they're like, anyway, so yeah, they're well indoctrinated. Yeah. They're not going to fall into it. Um, yeah, but they can see a big they, organization could be mm -hmm. like very fantasizing and idolizing and then you can get warped in it and be like, oh, it's not really what they say. It's like, yeah, it looks luxury and great. And oh, you get freedom and you can have your kids go here and they can become Sierra member. No, it's not like that. It's literally it's not like that. It's yeah. And uh, it's a trap. The the uh, all the work that the people that are doing the the actual First Amendment audits are doing, um, I think it's very important uh, up at the gold base. So the whole thing of like hide from protesters that was going on when I was there. So yeah, 20, 20 plus years ago, when anyone would be out front, that was the same thing as everyone hides so that you can get no footage. And at that time, it was the German news crew that was trying to uh, okay. film the RPA. That's there. That's what I was going to ask you. One, uh, did you? I don't remember this other than till later at the Int Ranch when I'm I was old enough. I was eight or not. I think I was like seven or eight, obviously in the governor's group, <laughs> digging mm -hmm. trenches out in the middle of this freaking Hemet heat in the middle of the year. You know, uh, yeah. digging trench. We all were. Duncan Alsop was like the governess in charge. Nathan Tompkins was the was our governess in charge. That's another thing. Like Nathan Tompkins. Wow. Watch me get sidetracked right now. I was going to ask you about the protest, but one of the things I do want to talk about quickly is uh -huh. uh, Sterling and Nathan Tompkins. I know, I don't know if you've been watching. I know you've been wor watching some of Surge stuff and we talked about that a little bit, but before we forget, I would, I would like to talk about Surge. I want to ask you a question about Surge's thing and Sterling and Nathan Tompkins, because Nathan Tompkins one time, in in a certain perspective of my life at the Ant Ranch, Nathan Tompkins was just a cadet, just like us, kind of smart ahead. And he had his cool other brother. This is what I imagine his cool other brother, mm -hmm. Sterling, uh, who eventually went to the gold base. But then Sterling came back and Mike and Justin and all uh, everybody, Matt, and they were basically stiffening up the ethics and showing like, hey, we're cadets that used to be here. Why are your guys' standards so low? Right. That's that's how it felt a little bit. So I do have this older like resentment for the older cadets or soon to be adults or then later gold staff who are like. Yeah who just clearly are just like, no, the Int Ranch cadet base for any child was a complete mind physical trap. If you were not doing a hundred percent Scientology Sea Org, you would mm -hmm. be getting in trouble for wanting to do little. And so for him to just on Sterling's note, I would say for him to think like that. I, one thing I watched on one of his videos is he was saying like, my dad is a good dad. Sterling, anybody's going to, and this is, I'm saying this to Sterling, if you only have this much time with your dad and it's so loving and great and you guys have a great time, that's not a good father. I'm sorry. And for some father yeah. or mother to put their father, their kids, their sons, their daughters in any, in any alignment like this was horrible, whether it was good or not. And they meant to do it right. Still not a good parent if they meant to do something right. If they meant to do something wrong, being a parent is very, as you know, Mike Brown, you have kids, is very hands on. It's very half of your mind is always on your children, literally. Like there's no way about it. So, so for Scientology um, okay. to break down a parent or to break down a child to think their parent is doing as much as they can. So they were the best parent to me. That's like you're not seeing the whole big picture. There's a right. bigger, bigger picture here. And if you break it down and you don't, and you were never born in the Sea Org of Scientology, if you were born in Italy or somewhere else, you would absolutely see this picture very clearly. Yeah. That's so let me, think. let me respond to that because that was a lot. And uh, <laughs> as usual, let me, I can give you my opinion on why on uh, I the differences. Yeah, yeah, I want to hear. So, and then, again, this is just my opinion based off of somebody that I know. 
Um, and I'll kind of cover a couple different bases. So let me cover through all this and see if it answers some of that just specifically. Like, um, so again, we have a different age gap with you. Sterling and I are about the same age. We're both about 47. And we're, so we're about 10 years older than you are. So we would have been teenagers when you were a younger kid. Um, so originally, how, old, wait, Sterling, how much, how, sorry, how much older are you than Sterling? Did you say? We're both 47. You're so both. The, like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like I, I think I'm like five months older than him or something. We're we're about the same okay. age, yeah. Okay, and Justin, yeah, he looks better. Obviously. He looks better than he look. You know, he's in better shape than me, but he also has no children, which you know he can. You know, he spends again, his time like, again, kind of again, stuff. Mike. All of us, <laughs> all of us have different views of what we think is attractive. Okay, good. So uh, anyway, back on the subject. Um, when we were kids in LA, about uh, about ten years old, um we were like feral loose on the streets of LA and it was, it sucked. And, uh, though you kind of get street smart and you're running around, it was a lot of, um, gangs in the area. We would get in gang fights. We were like getting our bikes stolen. We were having, uh, local gangs in the area that were not the, like the whole, if you were a Scientologist and they found you, they were going to beat the crap out of you. Um, Many years before that, I think it, this was before I knew Sterling. He has always, similar to you, um, you this is one thing you and Sterling have a lot in common. You are both, um, both usually stand up to authority and fight against it. And that's probably why both of you are able to get on here and do content in your own way. And you have very separate contents and uh, your own viewpoints, but you're both willing to talk out against something that you don't like. And I like that about both of you. And that's something that you both have in common. When he was younger, I want to say seven or eight years old, he was a little, he was not listening. He was, you know, um, what they call backflashing, refusing to do stuff. And he was placed on the PAC kids RPF. And he was, it was horrible. He was, they were spanking him. He was going through kind of the similar thing to you are. And he escaped. He literally ran out of the building, ran and found, um, I think either Barbara or um, Foster and went to them and said, I can't do this. I want out of here. They were going to hold me in there. And he was on it for like two or three days and couldn't, couldn't deal with it. His parents at that time took him out and they sent him to Mace Kingsley school and they pulled him out of the cadet org and all of that. And they sent him to this separate schooling, which was kind of public school. And he was then either involved in after school activities, um, playing baseball or going to school. And he had kind of a normal life up until he was like uh, 12, 13 years old, at which point he got kind of sucked in to go through the uh, the PAC EPF, their Estates Project Force boot camp, And then he got put in CMO PAC. And then he got in a bunch of trouble, at which point he then came up to the Ant Ranch when, when he would have been up there around the time that you, he either came up right before, or you two both came up probably around the same time. He would have been around 13 years old, 13, 14 years old. You would have been a small child. Like literally mm -hmm. like some of you are so freaking young. It just blows my mind when I think back about it, like how the fuck. So well, if you're 47, from his I'm 37. I, you guys were 10 years older than me, literally. Yeah. So how old were you when you came up? Were you like four, four or five four years, years old? old. Yeah, yeah. Four years old. When I So he would have gotten there like a year before you. And this is back when he first arrived. So, so that his experience in LA sucked. And when he needed, when he was about to get put in that kid's RPF, Foster and Barbara at the yeah. time kind of pulled him out of it and sent him to another school. So we all, we, we, one thing that is very much a uh, defense mechanism that kids do is we try to put our parents in a much higher regard, probably than a lot of them deserve. And that's the mm -hmm. thing that we do as a defense mechanism. And we make these, you know, kind of a magical thinking about how amazing our parents are and they're doing all this to save the planet and it's all worth it. And we tell us this story in our head, which helps us justify the existence that we have. And, um, and that's going to be true for any kid, but I will tell you Sterling's experience when he was down in LA versus coming up to the ranch. And he came up in the, in the early part of the ranch, which was still before all of the rules came into place. We were still doing a lot of the renovations. There was a little bit and more freedom didn't and you we guys, were mainly doing work. I was going to say, didn't you guys consider doing renovations freedom? It was kind of fun Loved to be it. painting so and so, same mm -hmm. with me. I still love it to this day. Like I it's not the point though. It's, it's about what Scientology was doing to normalize the behaviors that we were all doing. Like heavy mess work was actually just 
heavy adult work that children shouldn't be doing. Right. Um, but also I want to, now that I have daughters and, mm -hmm. um, you're, <laughs> And you want you, to teach them how to caulk the the baseboards and shine the well. I have the I have one. No I have one kid that when I'm yeah when I do one uh, stuff around the house, I have one daughter that loves to help me. One of one of my twins, she's like she's my little helper. She just loves to come up and do anything with me. The other one doesn't really care to. And then there's one that's into you know something else. So all of the kids they want to do their own thing, and if they want to help, and if we're doing some gardening or doing some stuff like that, it's a family activity. And it's kind of fun, but it's not an enforced thing. It, it, it was very different, I think, for like uh, boys that were in their teen, teenage years that were going through puberty, doing heavy manual labor, not having to do academic schooling. We were doing that instead, as opposed to like young girls like you and Jenna, who mm -hmm. were like being forced to do the same thing. Your, your picture in your mind about what you were doing is going to be vastly different. So even though, even though it's the same thing, the perception of it for me, I didn't hate that. I learned a lot of construction skills and I guess anything that I know about mathematics, I kind of taught myself about it at that time. Um, but, but it is like, true. It was what, trafficking. You know what this, and, and do you know what it sounds like? Do you know when hmm. this, uh, this only other time this happens is when people go to jail or prison and they have to, they're confined and it's actually joyful to read a book or to learn how to be a lawyer or to learn like, like, so it was exciting for us to do construction work or to learn how to roll the fire hoses exactly how the firemen do it and to be the one that was in charge to drive the lawnmower that I was so obsessed with. I'd be like in heaven. It was my favorite mm -hmm. thing. Like, so, and to make a garden and to all this. Yeah. So it's just, they made the normal work regular heaven oh like i don't i keep saying heaven but like it's just it felt like just like oh good i can you know relax my mind and i can just do this job that needs to get done and i'm being a good person so i can relax yeah it was always like and, that instead of joyful like it is to create now right and again so you're gonna have those kind of kids that uh they grow up like their family is like i have one guy that i'm in the military with um and he his whole family's um employment and the whole family business is cattle. So he's from Oklahoma and the family's business is like, everyone's a cowboy and they're out there doing cattle and it's a hard life. But at the end of it, they, you know, he joined the military, but the rest of the, um, people that, you know, brothers and sisters that are in that business, you're, you're inheriting a multi-million dollar cattle business at the end. You know what I mean? Like that's the family business. So you do have, there are times when kids like are doing this, but it's not, for the benefit of some random church organization that is, you know, kind of profiting from no. them. Meanwhile, you're living substandardly. That's just the way that that family lives, but you're getting a proper education and it's the family business. That is not what we were involved in. We were involved in like, we were, uh, this is, I, I very much think kids, we were all ultimately a huge inconvenience to have around and they had no idea what to do with us. And the best solution that they could come up with was to put us to work because every, like there are no children, everyone is just an adult. So they treat us all like adults and they're, they're going to, you know, have the uh, same um, criteria for children as they'll have for adults. And there is no differentiation, which the differentiation is massive, but it wasn't seen that way. Um, so anyway, really, going in the back same to, way in the same way that there's mm -hmm. like, like a, a Sea Org member today, like, like when we're protesting or whatever people want to call it, we're just standing out there and making sure people aren't going into the organizations. But um, when we're out there, a Sea Org member today would think it was insane uh, that, that we're saying, oh, you, you know, you overwork Sea Org members or you overwork children that are in, like, they're going, oh, they're just, uh, they're just because their belief system e is really like these are very capable kids and very capable children that are in small bodies. And you guys are referring to them as children, but they believe they're just as capable. And there's so many policies about like and stories of, oh, you know, this seven year old was running for L. Ron Hubbard as the messenger. And like it just made every oh, because L. Ron Hubbard was allowing it, then then it's always OK for every anyways. It's just there's so many things that 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 we don't want to call them what they are in the outside world because it sounds mm -hmm. too harsh to our ears. And that's when I yeah. love, for example, Serge, Serge Delmar, my very good, sweet friend. Um, 
whether you guys out there <laughs> have been watching him don't know if he's sweet. He's actually very sweet, amazingly sweet and so cute. And I love him to death. Um, but he really does lay it down. He nails it in the way that it should be heard. It needs to be heard in the way. And if it's shocking for you to hear that, you must try to see a little perspective or a view of how that could possibly be that way for you to mm -hmm. even like, I, and, and maybe I'm not, I'm saying this for everybody, for anybody, even in the people in the Sea Org at the testing center, for them to, to not even be able to hear the fact that like the Sea Org members are overworked or that the elder, you know what I mean? They can't hear that. They're going, what do you mean? We want to be here. This is like, how dare you accuse us of that? Um, yeah. So yeah, that's well, what I'm getting to. Sometimes you don't see. In, right. So, so Surge, um, and this is the thing. And, um, and then just kind of, because you had mentioned this to me before kind of about Sterling and I want to just uh, fully cover what we were talking about. So Sterling, um, in a t kind of just backtracking a little bit, and then I want to talk a little bit more about Surge and then other creators as we're sharing our truth and obviously getting on here from my perspective. And again, this is just, you know, my the way that I see stuff. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can, you know, all be as symbiotic as possible. We'll see how that yes. goes going forward. But Sterling's view of his parents, he's going to view his parents however he wants to. Ultimately, he's still trying to find a place of love in his heart for two people that at the end of the day have 100% abandoned him and they have decided to stay in that organization. And he's even talked about it. Like his stepmom Barbara, when he left and he was being declared, she cut him out of all the family photos. So no, he, like I've watched this, I've watched this and yeah, it, it makes me even more angry for Sterling. It makes me but more he, angry for Sterling that right. Sterling doesn't <laughs> listen. Barbara Tompkins. I loved Barbara Tompkins. Let me tell you this effed up situation barbara mm -hmm. tompkins was one of the sweetest sort of like more intelligent adults at the ranch but she was one of the closest ones to me that was spanking me the most so it's very annoying to hear his own son say that oh maybe barbara Tom or biddy were the best ones when or good parents or my father's good no sterling you got to wake up to the whole thing if you were your own father if sterling was his own father for his own son right now sterling jr he would be, he, uh, this is why I'm saying it's nice to talk to you and I'm not going to interrupt you anymore, mm -hmm. but it's nice to talk to you because you have kids and you were right there with Sterling. And so there already is a teaching method. We're not going to all have kids. So we're not going to learn like the deep, you know, mechanism or things that we've lost out on or that we didn't receive that we now go, Oh, if I can understand that I should have received that, that's going to actually help me heal further. Like in, in my own future, whether I'm not a child anymore, you know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah, I so hear Barbara Tompkins, this, that's what I was saying. Like, but I do get, I mean, even hearing your background, that what you the way you just described it with um the way he grew up in the it might have been a privilege for him to feel like he was going to the ranch and at least, hey, we get to do like fun things and look, there's a sports field we can create. I don't know. So I it's it's yeah, for so sure a whole different perspective. He was at he was at the ranch for um a shorter amount of time than I was at the ranch. I was there when it was during the time he was. And I, and I don't necessarily disagree with him. It was kind of like coming up from LA. It was pretty, pretty badass. That's what it I was mean. Awesome. Right. And then, <laughs> but then was he private, ended up going to Golden Air. Yeah. And we were able to hike a little bit and we were working. Right. And, we were and you the are sun, out in, in the middle of nature. Right. It was, we're not, it was, we're really not fun. having fights with gangs in the LA area that like, there was a lot more safety. Although <laughs> it was then you're like, now you're like definitely in a cult at that point, but it was, <laughs> it was better. So, um, let, let me, let me let me go into the perspective of differences in a person's uh, lens that they try to see their life in and opinions. And maybe maybe this will be a good bridge to cross on how p some people are just completely different and they can be different in their approaches and both um, right in their own ways. And we're never going to be able to get everybody to agree on everything. And so let me, let me give you two different people in the way that they talk about it, uh, di uh, things and see if, uh, we can kind of, you know, uh, relate these two. Let's take Serge. Uh, so as so we have Serge Del Mar and then we have Sterling Tompkins, they're both individual creators and they're going to create their own thing. Serge is going to talk about things. He's going to share his truth from his perspective, what he's passionate about. Um, and Sterling, 
had a difference in opinion. And then he went on and talked about like, hey, I don't necessarily think, and he didn't necessarily say Surge, but I think that Surge got the idea that he did. And he probably was talking about Surge, like, hey, I don't think that this is completely accurate. And Sterling was going to try to critique some of the specifics that Surge was saying. Those two had different lives and they all have, they also have different perspectives and they also have different backgrounds and the way they're trying to deal with their own trauma. And Sterling realized after he did that, he got a lot of like pushback from his audience and like, Hey man, you shouldn't ever tell somebody else what they can, how they should talk about it. The next, and then he and I had a, a conversation offline that says, Hey, look, your, your viewpoint on the way you see things is yours, Sterling surges is his and surge is not wrong. He might not be right about everything from your perspective, but that doesn't fucking matter. Like Serge is allowed to say whatever he wants, however he wants, because it's his journey on how he needs to heal in order to process his trauma. And Serge is going to get the point across to the people that are listening to Serge, and it's going to be important for people to hear it. Sterling, now, now let's kind of look at that same thing, but from another perspective. Sterling is trying to process his own trauma in his own way so that he can live in his own kind of existence. And he's going to do it in such a way that is going to, you're going to say, Hey, I think you should be harsher on your parents. Sterling's trying to approach it in such a way that is comfortable for him on how to do that. He's not wrong on the way he's trying to do it, even though you don't see everything he's doing is right. So the way I feel about it is surge needs to be able to share his truth. Um, we need to be respectful of Serge's truth. Sterling needs to be respectful of that, of which he did a follow-up video the next day and he's like, I'm a dumbass. I shouldn't have even fucking brought that up. I need to take a look at myself and kind of focus on me. And I think that that's a, like anyone oh, who, I, didn't, I don't know. I if, didn't, I don't know if I didn't see that video, but I'll watch it. But um, yeah, he did a follow-up no, and he pretty much said ass. like, hey, I don't want to do that. I don't think he's a and dumbass. I, and I'm using I colorful think... language. But I'm no, you know I mean? but I'm saying I think he is literally in real live time, like life. This is really ha like people are process. This is all part of the healing and processing. It's like, like, OK, I disagree with this, but OK. No, no, no. But now that I'm here, I'm kind of going, oh, you know what? You actually you're right. What you were saying is correct. I didn't I just didn't want you to say that my dad was a horrible parent and I took apparently or personally or whatever it is, whatever it is. Right. I think it's so great that we have these, it, there's nothing in Scientology. We were always taught that it was an okay to speak how you really felt and have the emotions you feel. So no, not we can, That's so we're allowed to 100%. be this way. We And Serge would have a conversation with Sterling in any, and he's not going to be rude and he's just going to be very blunt and loving about it though. He's not like yeah. attacking Sterling. I just think it would I be a beautiful thing for them to have a conversation live because of, just like we did. Sterling's at the end of Sterling's video, he's like, you know what? I need to reach out to Serge and I need to talk to him. I don't know if he has. Hopefully they've had a chance to talk, but he mentioned that he was going to try to reach out to him and them to actually talk it over because they, at one point, I think they were in the same friend circle and then people, you know, people go different ways. They're always busy doing other stuff. So, um, but anyway, just from the perspective of, is it important? So I think it's important that all of, um, the creators that as we're coming out and sharing our truths, because my experiences are going to be a little bit different and how I saw things and how I can bring them forward. And if there's big things that obviously somebody is like, Hey, that person is completely 100% lying. Um, <laughs> we should address those, try to address them like behind, like contact the person and say, Hey man, you got this wrong. Let's have a conversation about it. But if there's something that is very inflammatory and it's dangerous, then we should probably make sure that we, you know, have an open dialogue and we always have, um, the ability to, you know, kind of self-correct and uh, be able to get the truth out as best we can. Um, so that's why I love this YouTube platform is because Same. there is, there is no, there's no traffic cops for it. You know, mm -hmm. you, of course you'll, you know, if you did something that was obviously un, you know, unfit for, you know, YouTube consumption, they would flag the video, but that they, they give a lot of latitude for people to go on and do this. And that's the beauty of it because Scientology can't control it. And as much as, and I do love, and I know I'm going to caveat something because I'm probably going to get into some deep water that isn't, you know, necessarily where I want to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important saying this, mm -hmm. the, the previous, the only things that were available previously was somebody that was speaking out on a major news network um, that was then being edited by that news network. If, if something was coming forward 
And the problem with it is you're not able to get more than a five minute sound bite at most. And it's whatever that network wants to put out. And most of the time the story is lost. So now we have this large format conversations and people can consume it at whatever rate they want. But we can also share the entire story about something. And the thing that kind of changed a lot of this is when Leah started doing Scientology in the aftermath. And that that changed the public perception of the, the ability for people to speak up and be able to live through it and not end up at, like smashed by legal stuff. They're like, hey, wait, all these 30, 40, 50 people spoke up and they're still okay. And then the YouTube thing kind of started. We had some of the initial creators and then Aaron's channel got really big and a lot of people started doing stuff. So then as this has happened, um, so kind of to step back, a, a slight criticism that I have of Scientology in the aftermath is it was still a produced uh, series that was taking somebody's specific trauma packaging it in what would fit in about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, editing it down, high quality production and sharing that story. Um, but it might not be the person's whole story. And then it, you know, like I think Liz Gales talked about this a little bit. Um, when I talked with, uh, with Miriam, she also mentioned this, there wasn't any aftercare for a lot of those people that shared their story. They were left basically holding the bag of crap and Scientology then starting to fair game them with like, them not really getting any benefit out of it other than just like being able to speak their mind and the freedom of which to do that, of which it was an edited version of it. So what's great about this platform is people can come on and have the unedited truth about exactly what they want to say. And yeah. you can go on and you can talk about it and you can get your full story out there. And no one is the traffic cop. You can't have an editor or some legal person say you, mm -mm. Right. it's up to the individual to share their story. No one can say, you can't say that or oop, that's not going to, that's not going to make it past our legal team or something like that. People right. can say, this is what I went through and they can do that. And that's the beauty of these platforms. And I think we as creators need to continue to provide that space for one another as well as we can. And again, it's all people. And not take people. things so like seriously. And I mean, so yeah. like, oh, today, like, okay, look back at this in a week from now, you know, like, don't like, this mm -hmm. is all just talking and it's not like we're physically doing, we're all taking down Scientology. That's like, you know what I mean? So yeah. like, take a break from Absolutely. things. Don't respond or react in your physical emotions or upsets right in the moment. It's always, it's always good to give, don't put something in a box. Like I must answer this now. No, open that box and let it stretch open and just like make it bigger. Like, always when you feel like you need to respond to something right away out of like whatever you're feeling, then probably that means you need to give it 24 hours. Like relax, don't respond to anything. Even if it. you're a hundred percent, right. Just don't. We, we call that, we call that when we're uh, in the military tactical patience. Sometimes <laughs> you have to just like, like realize like, Hey, if I just jump into something right now, all I'm going to do is make a mess and get people hurt. If I just slow or what if it's a, a trap? Bit. You know, what if it's a trap, it's a trap. whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. it's a trap. <laughs> yeah. Don't go. Sometimes in. there's some benefit to have a little bit of like, uh, let's say, Mike, do you have any XRM? Uh, I don't, um, but that's a good idea. If there was, um, I know that there is that, like that talent. What does it say? Is, you have to read like, it so everybody can hear it. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Nancy, Nancy New 12. Yeah, she says, Mike, do you have any ex army mates who run a security company in L uh, company in L.A.? If not, you should tell any friend to start one. Uh, start looking after streets of LA and co. And yeah, co. that would be pretty cool. <laughs> and co. Really I think we need like right now they're like TikTok crew. I know streets LA. He's kind of got his own brand, but we need, I feel like we need a better, um, we need a better name for, for these people. I do like first amendment audits and I love that. The but I also that. just like, I just like that everybody has their own thing. Like TikTokers are doing thing. Da, 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 da. The fact that Chris oh, yeah. last night got arrested, sure. everybody's doing their own thing. So it's also, and it's, it's all different perspectives. Like nobody's going to be able to control like, hey, Jessica, go, go that way. Streets go that. Like, no, it's all just a worked effort. Like, oh, hey, okay, I'm going to go down here. Okay, you guys keep it cool. Of Like, see, you know what I mean? Everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked Danger Man 5, some people say you pre-drink a lot before you join the protest. Can you confirm this? First of all, Danger Man 5, who are some people? Who are you talking about that say this? Because not one person has said this to me ever. And I've never heard this in my chat because it is absolutely not true. There have definitely been moments where I have a beer right after I get off work and eat my pizza across the street from where Hollywood Center is. Absolutely. 
uh, and I go out there. But no, every other time protesting, I'm always having a drink or something after the protest, 1000%. But not before, because honestly, it it just triggers my PTSD and everything. So it's just, it's not fun. I'm like, look at me. I'm already like, I mean, I what? Now I'm getting, I'm so much calmer now, Mike. <laughs> Thank God. You've got the pink light going in the back. It's not all that, you know, it's not the harsh blue like I got going on. I should change my lighting too. Let me see if I can pull it yeah, up here. Let's train it to a little more pink so we can get into the more <laughs> entertaining aspects of it. Uh, but well, anyways, dangerous. I, do. I, I don't know. I, it made me, made me think that that was like a OSA bullshit random name. I hope you're not. And that was just a real question. I didn't mean to attack you on it. But uh, yes, I do love drinking. I'm not, I'm not hiding that from nobody. And I think every Everybody in the world are oh that's good right there look at that <laughs> yeah i i do but i yes i do love to for example we went with the protesters after on street after the whole streets la and everything a few night one very first time i went and then like a week after when i went again because we already knew but we found out there's this little place that we go to our little hole in the wall that does karaoke and i was like there's no way what a perfect celebration for lara fm to go protest and right. then go have some beers drinks and pizza and go sing karaoke and so we all went all like it was really fun i'm not gonna say who went with me in case they don't want to be told but uh and then later serge and i did a live when we were singing karaoke same thing went there had a great time after so that was really good fun. you should be able to uh, you should be able to cut up a little bit after that so see that's the thing oh 100 like, percent. like um, and who should or shouldn't like who's the boss and the police of telling who does like how yeah. somebody should act after a certain thing and do you drink before this and and who cares do you know how many people we see sit standing there? <laughs> Not sit, we people see as standing there that walk by. Half the people on Hollywood Boulevard are drunk. They're on something. They're and and they're out yeah. of their minds. So I'm just saying, it's just, it's just, it's. Um, I guess I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Well, let, let me ask you this question because I I moved away. Like when I left, I moved first to Colorado, and then shortly after that, I joined the military, and then I've been bouncing around from base to base as I've been, and you know, in different countries. But I point being is I I left L.A. So I've been back to L.A. a couple of times to um, all all times to see my mother to help her out of that situation. But every time going back to L.A. is very stressful for me to do that and uh going <laughs> so around the complex this year uh, this year this this friday, this friday. coming yeah. and i was gonna go do a little road traveling and i decided this is so much stress and i was like and i want to be there friday i also had something else happening during the day and i was like nope it's actually more important for me to be here Friday mm -hmm. and to be able to be there for all. I want to go to the, all the blues, like all the LA buildings that stress us out. Like it's amazing, yeah. Mike. I'm telling you, you like get stressed people, out? You go not anymore. Oh, the first few you could see, I was like a <laughs> panic attack. And then honestly, after my dad thing happened, I'm like, and knowing how corrupt the LAPD is, I was just like, you know what? No, no. I'm going to be my beautiful self because no matter what I'm doing is never going to be illegal and gross like these people are doing, you know, so I'm not afraid anymore. And if I hadn't done all that and I didn't see my dad not giving a fucking shit about me yelling his name out and then having the police officer be like, oh, I don't believe that was your dad. I'm just like, who are you to even be speaking right now? That's so crazy. Anyway, so I have kind of I'm not and even talking to you, Mike. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate the people that are on SPTV so much. This is so mm -hmm. important. I've said this so many times. This is so important for, sure. uh, for for people who are watching that will never come on a live ever. The kids that were all at the, the 80 other kids that were at the in ranch and people watching us, Mike, who are nowhere to be seen or nowhere to be heard. They are watching. There's some people who are watching that you wouldn't yeah. have any idea that we have mentioned on our lives that either had did you know done something too extreme either to children or animals where they were basically not allowed to even be on the base anymore that's how bad it's like until it gets so extreme that it could become an actual criminal legal issue then we're gonna offload you that's what they call it when they make you think okay sorry am i going on a rant that's okay I'm blowing off steam it's good <laughs> people like to listen to it <laughs> We're running a marathon, guys. This is, we're just, what is it? It's not a race. It's, 
it's, I don't know, whatever. Okay. Rodu says, question, if kids are doing all this heavy labor, building things, what is the quality of the work? Really good. First, you should watch a first, kid. At first okay. it wasn't great, but remember, okay. so do you remember these videos we used to watch? I don't know if they were still having you guys watch them or if they were just having us train you at that point. Initially we were watching these home improvement videos. I wish I could find these. They were by a couple called Peggy and Dean. Um, and they would go on and it was this, it was this woman with this like very eighties hair and she's in these mom jeans and they're teaching you how to like, this is how you do home electrical. And it was all just home improvement shows. This is how you do drywall. And we'd watch that. And then we would then go and do it. But a lot of the materials that we were using initially, because Scientology is cheap as shit, even though they have a bunch of money, it was like old stuff that like Home Depot or Lowe's was like throwing away or had been out in the rain and they can't sell anymore that we bought for on the on the cheap. And then we're now we're using this like and then lumber the that's ramp. like all shitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so whenever this? we do stuff. So wait, wait, wait. Whoa, pause. I have so many questions. Um, What okay, would the vehicle be? I know these are stupid questions, guys, and I don't care because they're not stupid to me and they're very important to other people. Um, What were what was the vehicle you were using? Do you remember what vehicle or whatever you were using to go from the Ent ramps to where some hardware store? So do you remember Gene Tomazovic? Yes, 100%. I've, I, all of okay, these so people she are was, in a scroll that eventually yeah. I'm going to have to talk all about. So Jean Tomazovic, she was one of the people assigned at the ranch, and she was in charge of logistics. She was and, there the, one um, of the longest adults that was at the yeah. ranch, by the way. like she right. And she never was really a threat to the kids because she handled all, like you said, the logistics in terms of like services and like um, like the simple things like, oh, kids are so excited. Gene Tomazovic, Mr. Tomazovic's here. Remember, Mr. Everybody's a Mr. So with the right. Food. So initially she was in charge of she was in charge of all the logistics. So that included um, all Runs. of the building supplies and it included food. And then later we had this lady, Mar Margaret or Marg Horner. Margaret. It was yeah, moved Margaret out there. Horn. Yeah, Mr. she Horn. was in. She was. Morning. Yeah, she was in she was put in charge of just handling the meals back and forth. So she would move the meals from so Golden Era Productions what, out to the yeah. ranch under Jean. So she was made an assistant for Jean. And when they say move, um, me and me and Jackson talked about this on earlier episodes and multiple times. I'm like, Gary, let's remind everybody uh, when they say move the food, it means that there was a run from the Int Ranch to the Gold Base and they would have like service pans of food and that's what they would bring for the each every three meals a day mm -hmm. or we'd already have breakfast from the next day with granola buckets or buckets of yogurt or a box of apples or whatever it is or a, yeah. a, a service pan of uh, scrambled eggs. Slop eggs. Every, right. <laughs> oh, gross. They sit they, did, they did, never smelled right and and they was well half Why of them were they would be hard us, like, and the other the half extra. would be soft. Anyway. Ew, ew. Well, that's just what happens. You put eggs Liz, in a big pile, they get nasty. Liz Ferris, so. yeah, Liz was like, yeah, sometimes the pan would turn them green. Do you remember? There would be a oh, slight yeah. tint of green around, uh, around the edges. Uh, yeah. So Jean, okay. going back to it. So Jean yeah, was Jean in Tomasi. charge of. So and then later her the last name is Jean. Her last name later was Jean uh, Larson. She married a security guy at the Ant Ranch. Oh, did she? Okay. That probably was after uh, I left. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So, Jean Tomazovic. So, <clears throat> so she, and then Margaret she was Horner. like, we're on this we're on this shoestring budget. So, uh, let's say that the <laughs> normal renovations for these, um, for all of our dormitories, which were referred to as the motels, it, they were literally old motel units that we were renovating. Let's say that we needed $30,000 in order to renovate the entirety of the building for new paint, fix the walls, patch everything, new electrical. Let's say if that was the budget, $30,000, we got eight or 5,000. And it was like, okay, you solve it. You got to make things go right. So then she would go around and literally go to junkyards, almost like the stuff that like these big box stores, like, you know, Lowe's and, you know, uh, building supply places were getting rid of things and, and she was getting things for pennies on the dollar. So when I you cannot, get building materials like this. that, they were shitty. They were I like, was you know, so you get a piece Jean's of drywall, half of it's waterlogged. And you, and they would just cut, like, I remember we would razor blade that part off and just use whatever anyways. But yeah, so I do like remember you're, re stuff. you're reminding me that Jean Tomazovic used to be very good. Like she had all these outside connections and, and she was she one was of the few person. adults. Yeah. She would want to be one of the few adults that would be talking to people on the outside. Mm -hmm. Were you so there when the uh, Cisco truck, the, the Cisco chip trucks and all that would come? Um, was that, or Frito Lay's so to restock? The, 
the so I, I remember seeing those at, at gold. Um, I don't know. Did they ever come out to the ranch? So later they started making the runs. Yeah. Around nine, 10, once you guys got our ethics in, uh, they started sending the, the gold, some of the gold W O G S as they call them, um, to the in ranch base via like, Oh, drop off gold and then drop off some at the in ranch to, to, Instead of just somebody putting it on the run, the Frito Lay was like, "Oh, we could just drop it off there." So, and that happened yeah, to be a lot of stories where doing... people were like okay. sneaking out off the property, jumping on the back of the Frito Lay truck, and not letting them see. <laughs> they and should. they thought it it was just fun. We thought it was fun, like, "Oh, good, we get a ride outside." Look, they don't know us. And they were yeah. like, "You guys were trying to leave the property with a lot." But, uh, but uh, uh, Rodo. So, uh, some of our the initial stuff. Maybe it wasn't great, but we actually got pretty good at doing it when you're doing it. And, you know, and, and if you don't do it right, they make you fix it. So, you know, I will say that, you know, their kids have fine motor skills and you get good at doing something. And we did a lot of grounds work. We did a lot of construction. We did a lot of different things. And I would say what we did wasn't bad. Um, it was very economical for Scientology. Um, so <laughs> anyway, as child labor normally will be. It's um, right. And always it's always they always anything that's economical for Scientology is always sort of like shitty. Like, oh, that's really crappy how we got that. Or it's mm -hmm. like it's just done in the, the worst way or they receive the worst quality of something because they were trying to get the best price quote approval yeah, from so you the, get the, you know. So we ended up I like, was watching you know, one of your lives. Fixtures, they were shitties. Shitty fixtures. Was, like if you right. you put in a, a faucet, it's going to start leaking after six months because you bought. The and then you're going to have thing. to be like asking for another thing, and they're going to be like, right. "What you're getting? Oh, so you're going to the RPF for making us waste money for buying the same thing?" Yeah, no, I remember. I was just watching you talk about this on a live one of your live streams, and you were saying like to get a purchase order, they wouldn't. You were like, "Fuck it, I'm not getting it approved. Go, it needs to happen, or this is not going to." Do you remember you oh, were talking about? Oh, it's one of the things they put in my suppressive declare. Oh yeah, there um, you go. Your, <laughs> for yeah, later, yeah, yeah. So, for later. Yeah. Yeah. So this is when I was working at Golden Air Productions. They weren't covering in financial planning the repair of the like the multi-million dollar copy machines, like on-demand copy presses that they got that had to be serviced by a Xerox technician. They didn't want to cover the service on them, and then they want us to work around the clock. So you're working around the clock, and then at two o'clock in the morning, the machine breaks down, and you have deadlines to get this stuff produced and get to, you know, on, on a plane so it can go to the, you know, the June 6th event on the maiden voyage. So David Miscavige can release, you know, some lecture series. What am I going to do? I'm going to call the repair dude. So I'm like, called him and they're, they're like, you incurred a bill. And I'm like, okay, my bad. That's <laughs> why I'm a big bad on. SP is because I'm yeah. making your shit work. So. Yep, exactly. So crazy. Anyway. Um, okay, so oh, okay. um, th so you were saying the quality of work though. At the beginning, it was like we were just being like fun kids, right? And then there was for me, it felt like all of a sudden they raised the standards and was like, no, you can't leave a bubble like that in the varnish on the dresser. That's gonna look like cr like they then like got very specific, like it has to be clean and clean it with ammonia. And Elron Hubbard says, don't put you know, don't use whatever on windows must be vinegar and water or whatever there's or new whatever it is no color print yeah, so, on, you know like there's all these little details of things that were keeping our little minds so busy so i think um and i've and i've tried to reflect back on like how could how could these things kind of generationally get worse and worse and i think it kind of goes back to you then have indoctrinated children that get a little bit older who are still children. They're just, you know, and they're just teenagers that are then put in points of responsibility for kids they shouldn't be taking care of. And then it's like, it's kind of the snowballing effect of it starts getting kind of generally, uh, generationally worse, uh, or the same kind of abuse that maybe happened to a kid when he was young is then going to be perpetrated later. Um, you know, or the, you know, you're, you're working in an environment um, where you, it is very militaristic and you, the demand is for you to act like the military. And I've, I've kind of been thinking about this and I'm actually going to be talking to Stephen Hassan, um, about this specific thing because he had a, um, I'm, I know I'm kind of getting off the subject, but I think it's, this is, this is kind of, you'll, you'll find this interesting. Uh, Stephen Hassan, he does a podcast, uh, freedom of mind, and he 
Um, he's the one that's combating cult mind control. He has uh, some amazing work that he's done that it really helps you identify what is it that defines a cult and how does a cult come into being and what is the difference between a cult and another high control group. So he had one of his um, uh, guests on, and um, Daniela Young, and she grew up in this uh, religious group called Children of God. And these people, you think we had it bad growing up? The, the, all these little girls were basically like, like slaves on a sexual level for a bunch of weird old men. And that's how they were raised like from day one. And they were like children having children and everyone like these old men sleeping with them and stuff. It was horrible. This was her upbringing. And she was very, very intelligent and always kind of going against the rules and stuff. She got herself out of that. She ended up getting herself through college and then she joined the military. And when she joined the military, it felt for her like going from one cult into another cult. And she then had a very kind of negative feeling about the military after that. But for me, my childhood wasn't as bad as hers. If I just look at that, it was there was a lot that was wrong with it, but it wasn't to that extreme. Like when you listen to her book, it's like, oh, my God, this is terrifying. But my experience in the military has been quite positive. But again, I'm I'm male. Um, I grew up in Scientology and the Sea Organization, and it almost prepared me for going into the military and making the military psychologically easier than what the way I grew up. So uh, for me, I've seen a lot of benefit from my time in the military. So we're going to just talk about the differences in my experience coming out of Scientology and then going into the military. Um, but I think one of the things that's happened um, kind of coming full circle is the people that were older that were put in charge of the kids at the ranch, a lot of them were were originally children that were in positions of being either controlled or manipulated and kind of put into um, a situation where they were um, kind of indoctrinated and coerced into acting and behaving a certain way, which may or may not been kind of their root self. That's the way that they were indoctrinated to be acting and they were kind of just doing this as a survival mechanism, even though it then resulted in just perpetuating abuse yet again onto somebody else. And that I think is what is so devious about this. Um, when you have like generations of people that were either brought in at a young age or born into Scientology that never really had a decision to be able to be in this on their own and their parents were just shoving them into it. And, um, and the organization was happy to have us just work there and be there. And we had no ability to say no and to say, hey, I don't want to do this. I want to do something else when I grow up. That was never an option. Um, I just think it's sad. Um, and I wish and I think that that's the story that really has never been told is the children of Scientology on how this occurred from the early stages. I know that there was the stuff on the Apollo and that's part of the story too, but how does this generationally keep just getting worse and worse and worse now to the point of like, they don't even allow kids there, which I love um, because they, it got that bad. Yeah. I don't know. I said a lot there. What do you think about any of that? <laughs> no, that all of it. And, and also it just brings us People forget that, like, you know, we're there in the outside world. I know this sounds weird for the people watching, but like they are they've been sort of even in their own cults and everything. They've had this view of being able to be in the outside world. So like they've had some structure of some family being in the military. So they know what the military is like being a cadet, the int rancher in the Sea Org. You, you never have this perspective. There's no connection. There's no sincere connection even to family members that I have today still so much to a point where they there's family members that um don't talk to me because they're afraid they'll never be able to talk to my mom their uncle and their aunt or whatever it is like um they don't want to push push the thing and it's just like a lot of this is just like uh recycled trauma and recycled fear of everything that we've all been going through so like a lot of it's going to come out a lot of different ways and I think the fact that it's coming out is so important, whether it's going to take some people to think like, oh, I can never be a good person. Oh, my God. No, that's not true. Come out and talk about it. That's like the best thing to do. And whether it doesn't have to be live right away, you don't have to like come and talk to me on the live stream and show the world like all of our flaws. No, it's talking about it and having the conversation and then being ready like, OK, good. We can talk about this or we can talk about anything we need to on the live chat and 
and help other people heal from things that haven't been able to be discussed directly to them or for them. Yeah. And so that can come out in many ways on so many different channels, on so many, in so many different emotions. One day an interview will be great. The other day will be horrible. Or one will feel like, oh, we had a great talk or that was so funny. I thought that was going to be horrible. Like everything's just a little bit different. So, yeah. Yeah. Got to give it a shot. I think that was good. Yeah. Enjoy the silence as you two are the only one who have the courage to confront your perception with magic ingredients, listening, respect, honest, and talk about uncomfortable things. Yes, exactly. That's what we want to do. There's well, no feels judgment. A little less uncomfortable this time. A little bit. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> a little just a little bit. Somebody said uh, D Sweatman, aka COB. <laughs> Imagine being the Frito Lay guy and being like, what the F is this place? So a lot of the kids, like Mitch would say, Mitch Brisker, uh, we were so excited when somebody would come onto the property, whether it was a gold staff member or a person from the outside world of planet Scientology. Like we were just so excited. And so it probably just looked like, oh, my God, look at all these kids are just so sweet and fun and happy and they're hanging all over us. Oh, my God, they must be like so. It, Yeah, that's what it probably looked like to the Frida Lay guy. So there was a funny story and uh, this might've been, you were either really young or it's before um, you came up there. Um, <clears throat> we used to have like the Saboba uh, Native American Indian reservation is right uh, there. Like you have to drive through it to get to this property where this international uh, child ranch was. And it's now been sold back to them. They actually got their property back. Um, so, but <clears throat> before they had to, you had to literally drive past their casino into this prop uh, through their property in order to get to where the kids were kept. Uh, so it was very isolated, but we would commonly have the Indian, um, you know, representatives and stuff coming out there. And, uh, there was this one weird contractor dude. He wasn't an Indian, but he was like a handyman, Jack of all trades guy that Gene Tomazovic and Dan Probelsky, who are the people that were in charge of the ranch at the time were having come out to do like, specific jobs that we couldn't do like he would come out and like he would run a piece of heavy equipment that the kids couldn't run but he was just like a uh like a and anyway he would do odd jobs and he was not a scientologist he was just some guy that they found from town to have do work so anyway a local news network got a hold of this dude and got his thoughts about all the kids. And he was like, this is the way I think kids should be raised. You know, I think they should be made to do a bunch of hard work and stuff. This guy had like a rap sheet, like super long that included all sorts of child abuse and like, bur like burglary and like no nothing. God. But he was, he was out of jail, but he was like, what, what was, what was his uh, mindset, his behavior, the way he thinks right, but is the, clearly but then off. The, the, yeah, but then the piece they did in the paper was like, hey, this former, you know, like, you know, this guy with all of these different crimes and stuff thinks this is the way children should be raised. And it aligns right with Scientology. So it looked horrible. It was horrible PR. Somebody got in big, big trouble for that. The guy wasn't allowed to come back at all. It was like a big flap at the time. So then that's when they then had Golden Era Productions, uh, heavy equipment operators. They would start filling in the blanks for when we needed additional like help, they would have the estates professionals from gold uh, come out and do it so that we weren't using as many um, public or I'm, I'm not wanting to use the derogatory term because I know that is, you know, even though it's a Scientology derogatory term, but a non Scientologist, they weren't going to use any more of those. Um, but that, yeah, that's one of the things that happened. It was hilarious because it was a total problem. Um, anyway, good times. Yeah, good times. <laughs> good times talking about the horrible times. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so, oh yeah, we were, we were on the free loading thing. There was also other people like the propane guy, the gas company would come to the Int Ranch base. I was oh, trying to remember what propane other... propane tanks. Yeah, and so... <laughs> there I, were you, several of them. You, yeah, and you remember like when they would come on the property, it would smell so bad like perfume. Those propane tanks. Like imagine dealing with propane all day just in general. I mean, imagine if they thought, oh, perfume makes me smell good. So they're already losing. This is to me what I was thinking, like, oh, they must have lost their smell to propane. And now they just put on all this cologne and they just smell. Yeah, now they're so wearing bad. extra cologne. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain uh, there are certain um, I don't know. In some cultures, they wear a lot of I've noticed this as I'm around different cultures, as I travel around the world in some countries, like some men after they shower will use all of the cologne like a 
ridiculous amount, like to the point of like some, they walk into the building, you can smell them from the other side of it. Um, but yeah, yeah that's, how the, that's exactly how the propane, the propane dude right. was like bathing in it. <laughs> it was like a mixture oh of bio propane and I was like, like brute aftershave. <laughs> I would rather smell the propane. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, I was trying to think who else. Oh, the guy that comes with the dishwash liquid stuff to, for the dishwashing. Like the, oh, anybody who had to bring chemicals and things onto the property that obviously little cadet's going to do. T. Louise also gave us a sweet little super chat. Thank you. Or a, what did and you uh, show interesting. Uh, so the question is, I'm so confused why Scientology gets away with child labor. If this was average citizen, they would have been arrested. How are they getting away with this? So uh, the long and the short is I... Uh, Along the short answer is I think that they realize they're not allowed to. Um, and it's created a legal problem for them because um, you can say we, uh, Laura and I are the end result of a Scientology upbringing. You're going to have, you know, people who are struggling to kind of figure out their place in the world and all this sort of stuff. And uh, what is the attrition rate on, on uh, kids that were in Scientology? It is very, very high on the amount of when we all came to a certain age, we were able to start. You just used a word. Uh, you just used a word. I don't understand. You so how many attrition? people leave? Attrition? What's what did you attrition, say? Attrition, like, so uh, attrition, like uh, attrition? when a person, so attrition is when, uh, when you have a group of people that start on a process, let's say that uh, people like a, there's a class that everybody starts and you have a, and you have a hundred people that start the class. And then out of the hundred people, only uh, 10 out of the hundred would end up passing the class. The attrition rate is 90% at that point. So you're going to say how many people failed at mm, that thing or okay. ended up getting out of it did not succeed or were not able to pass it. That would be the, uh, the attrition rate. So if we looked at out of the 80, let's just call the number of kids that were at the ant ranch out of the 80 90. of us there was, okay, let's call it 90 out of the 90. Well, cause of us you're also there. How many do give you a think full... left? Well, I was going to say, what is the attrition use? What is it again? How do you say it? Attrition. 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 So what do you mean? What are you including in the attrition rate? Uh, people who were the, offloaded, people who were, who blew, people who unalived themselves, people. Well, the, so seeing the attrition the, rate is the, the people talking on SPTV in the end are the only people who have successfully left that mentally, unless they are totally openly in uh stand like talking or helping people in the SPTV community right then, right but let's look otherwise at it this they're way. still like, stuck let's say in the Sea Org to a degree but how like let's say out of the 90 of us that the goal was for us to all be international oh. based staff members working mm -hmm. at international executives. management yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and executives and working there doing that how many of us actually are not there doing that have been kicked out offloaded right. didn't make it to the goal of what we were supposed to that wow. the the experiment failed would you say mm -hmm. that it was probably over 75% didn't yeah. end up working out the way they yeah, wanted it yeah, to? Yeah. I would say yeah. even so, right now, there's only 10%, maybe 20% left still at gold, not even. Yeah. So I would say the vast majority, it is not a workable system for kids. Um, so they've they've stopped these uh, the cadet organizations. They're no longer doing it because it was a legal, it was a legal risk for them. We are a talking legal risk for Scientology. That mm -hmm. is what we are right now. <laughs> Yeah. Which is why when there's any critical comments, I just go, I don't care anymore. I don't care. That's it. I don't care. I really don't. And not like this one. Hi, Super Storm Day. Thank you for your sweet, shitty chat chat superstar sticker, whatever you call it. I love everybody making this movement go and covering so many aspects in so many ways. Thank you. Big hugs. Yes. Right. So everybody that includes everybody. Don't the adults who think kids are adults in small bodies. Remember how they themselves felt as children just because the adults know the kids used to be adults. The kids don't. Right. This is I feel like what Serge talks about. This is where the, the you know, the accountability needs to come in. Like, yeah. You know, there's so this is something this is something that I struggle with. Um So the people that were, so a person that decided to go into Scientology and uh, they said, hey, this is the path that I want for myself as a consenting adult is very, very different than um, a child that they brought along with them that was never able to make that decision on their own. And I think that it is very dangerous to um, put kids in that sort of situation because we were all undereducated. 
we weren't being provided for. Uh, our education was a complete afterthought. No one gave a crap about giving us a proper education. It was actually, I think, a benefit to the organization to not do this. But the adults in charge of us, um, I think there is a degree of uh, cognitive dissonance, which is you see something that you don't agree with and you kind of come up with a reason why you think it's okay anyway, just because it makes it more uh, easily digestible in your mind. There is a lot of that that I think went on with people, but you do have people at the very higher levels. And I know Serge is on a roll going after a lot of these people for this. They were there in charge of stuff with the full picture of what was going on. The majority of us, I would say the vast majority of people in this organization have a very tightly controlled amount of information that they're given, and they do not have the ability to know all of the specifics of the legal stuff that's going on the actual perceptions of what's going on in the outside world, the fact that all of the statistics that Scientology shows their people are completely bullshit and fabricated. Like the normal staff member does not know that. They are completely oblivious to the real world because they're not allowed to watch TV. They're not allowed to surf the internet. They don't watch all of our bullshit on YouTube. They don't do any of that stuff. They, they have the reality spoon fed to them. Um, so that that's what they actually, they really believe. Like when they're there, they think, and I, um, Aaron did a thing where he was, uh, he just did a, a, a massive, um, podcast and he, he actually, uh, gave the analogy of that movie, the matrix, you know, when you're in the matrix, it's like, Hey, do you want, which version of reality do you want? Do you want the fake reality of like, you're plugged into the matrix or do you want to have the real reality where you're unplugged from the matrix, but everything is very uncomfortable. Would you like to live in the real world, even if it sucked? Or would you like to live in the fake world, even, you know, just because, you know, you can have this picture in your mind about how happy you are, but it's not actually real. So Scientologists, even though that's kind of a, an analogy that it they didn't get this from the movie The Matrix, but there's a lot of that same belief system that occurs. They will go through a lot of shit because they believe that this is a prison planet. Everything that's happening in the real world is completely um, not true. This is their only chance at survival for the millennia. They have to sacrifice now in order to be able to reap the benefits in their, you know, upcoming lifetimes. And that is a very dangerous mix because you can weaponize people in a religious way to do things that are completely illegal. And that's the situation that we're finding ourselves in with Scientology. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tampa Ag, Ag Girl, Tampa A Girl. <laughs> Thank you for your super chat. Keep talking because voices carry. Voices carry by till. I was going to say you must know till Tuesday. Voices carry by till Tuesday. Would love to hear, hear, ear. Lara cover that song. Voices carry. Hush, hush. Keep it down now. Voices carry. All right. Well, yes, I love that. I'm going to do really everybody much. a solid and not do a singing follow up. I'm just going to let you cover that. I'm not a singer. Uh, Tampa, a girl. Thank you. She says, love you to educating us. I love that. Thank you. We feel so educational. Oh, Lee, uh, we feel like edu educationalists. <laughs> we feel educated. Um, are you feeling educated? <laughs> How did you learn to read? Did someone sit down and read with you? Another child teaching the younger ones. But see, Seuss asked that. Um, Mike, do you remember how you learned to read? <clears throat> so for me, um, before my parents got involved in Scientology, I was uh, struggling a lot in public school and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And reading for me was very, very hard. Um, it was something that I was in the process of getting a lot of help with before my parents got divorced and my mother decided to join the C organization. So I was thrust into this world where now I'm being having Hubbard study tech kind of forced down my throat and um, I didn't really have any good um, therapy solutions. So as bad as this sounds, um, the work at the Ant Ranch when we were not being educated and we weren't being given time for school was an easy solution to me uh, to not have to confront the problem that I had with reading and dyslexia. And I was just working. So I was doing manual labor and working for me. It was, um, it was both, uh, on the short term. I was glad that I hadn't, didn't have to sit there and feel like I was an idiot for not being a good reader. 
Uh, but then in the long term, as months and years would pass, I started, my anxiety became higher and higher and higher because I was still had the same struggles with reading. So as a result of that, it made me very easily controlled later when I was trying to escape and wasn't able to and was kind of locked down and decided to then stay into the C organization because I did never think I could be successful if I left because I was that bad at reading. Um, that was my story. But the uh, the time that was spent in terms of the education that was being provided for the kids, we were supposed to be good readers, have a 10,000 word vocabulary, uh, focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic. Arithmetic being basic math, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, nothing advanced, and no science history or anything like that, no extracurriculars. Um, and it was pretty much going to be focused on us being uh, and then there was a lot of Hubbard teachings that we were being good there. The idea was we were going to be cogs in this machine. So there was no incentive to an, educate us at a level where we could be usable in the society because we weren't supposed to go into the society. We we're just supposed to work uh, for pennies on the dollar. Uh, if and for not even for, for but not life. for pennies on the dollar work for clearing a planet and thinking you're like mm -hmm. money's actually not even a issue. Money's not a right. We're not thinking about money. We're just thinking like, oh, well, I'll be able to get my paycheck and get some of that yummy canteen snack, which where are we putting the money when we when we get paid for 40 whatever dollars a week? Where's that money going mm -hmm. on tampons on the internal canteen? Like maybe if you get a lot, lids, of, a lot of people cigarettes, uh, if you live, mm -hmm. uh, if you're, you know, you're you wanting to go on a small LOA, you're going to have to save up for the year. So you're putting a little chunk, a big chunk of that off to the side. So you're going to, you know, at least have like $500 when you go on your leave of absence. <laughs> it's just so crazy. I remember like planning all these little things and I can't imagine what my mom and dad were doing every time we had to go up, have good PR when we leave the mm -hmm. branch and up, we're going to see our non-Scientology relatives. So we have to have good PR, which means good PR right. for Scientology. Hey, there was a question that I didn't want to miss. Oh, uh, thank you. So I appreciate that. Let's see back at nine minutes. Uh, sorry, at 927 from Kells Bells. Um, I like that. We can pull it Kells up. Bells. Yeah, I Kells can, Bells. <clears throat> cool. uh, can, uh, you can you provide you specific from... locations or addresses for the hotels where kids abuse so protests can be done there? So um, I know s a l some of these places that we're talking about, like the one that we're talking about with this ranch, and there was also another ranch, the, the one where we had for the international uh, property, that one does not exist anymore. Uh, but the the parent organization is uh, Golden Era Productions, um, which, you know, I can kind of pull up their address right here and I'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, there was another uh, location that is down, that was down in Los Angeles, which was the PAC, which is their Pacific Area Command. That's what they refer to as PAC, but that's LA. That ranch doesn't exist anymore either. But all of the mother churches, like in the, the Hollywood area, that whole big ridiculous building that has Scientology biggest shit on the front of it. If if anyone wanted to go and protest, you know, that, you know, children should not be abused or anything like that. And my big hobby horse that I want to actually push is I think that there's 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 three locations which Scientology can absolutely stand to lose their asses when it comes in the legal arena. Child abuse, that's why they're trying to minimize the amount of children there. Elder abuse, which they have a serious fucking problem with because they have an aging population in there and they've been taking horrible care of them and they've been financially ripping them off for years. My mother's story is an excellent example of that. And the other one is in any financial abuse or, uh, you know, a uh, dealings that they've done, which have been illegal. All of those things are inexcusable. They have nothing to do with church doctrine or anything like that. It's just because they're a bunch of sick fucks. Sorry. Um, but I know, but, so, but I would also say that when people ask this question, where should they go? Scientology and the Sea Org are all aligned. They all know and feel and think the same thing. Like, so you can go outside any building where you see uh, a hotel, you said specifically hotels, uh, the Fort Harrison Hotel, the Sandcastle mm -hmm. Hotel. These are in Clearwater. Um, they also call the Osceola Hotel. Those are three hotels in Clearwater that you can at any time go protest or walk around and just let them know like they're in a cult. Um, 
It's, you know, it's not okay for people to not have knowledge. Communication is the big, is the universal solvent. Why aren't you, you know, reading what is on the internet and what is being hidden from things like this, things that are going to get the attention. But other than that, to um, bring it, what it does is that on through the media and everything, it's bringing attention to the the religious, quote unquote, religious status that Scientology legally has. And they use this legal weapon as a weapon. They use this religion to hide and to uh, protect people who are paying and in good standings of whatever Scientology wants them to do. If they're paying them enough, if they're on course, if they're, you know, whatever it is, then they're able to get away with any so so to speak sins or anything that they are uh, anything that anybody in the outside world would think is not acceptable the, apparently scientology if you just go get you know pay for some auditing go pay for an intensive since you know your mother and mother-in-law and everybody is just going to be so happy for you if you do as well just make their day and everybody's day that's involved. Oh, and this will help so-and-so's manager get this part for this movie. So it just all adds up. It's all about Scientology. Wow, I'm getting sidetracked, but it's all so any in... buildings. Oh yeah, any buildings you go to. In mm -hmm. LA, go to any buildings that say Scientology, that have the thing, anywhere that says Scientology, the psychiatry, uh, what is that? Human uh, Citizens Commissions. I think it's CCHR, that psychiatry yeah, CCHR. kills the something yeah. on sunset anyways just look them up there's i should put them all out I, maybe i'll put them up on on uh just like well i a, put in here just uh in the chat i uh and um i put uh the 19625 gilman springs road uh san jacinto california uh, i put that address in there that is where um Sorry, I, I, I was missing a space in there, but that is where I think they, they uh, some of the protesters recently went up there. You'll yeah. you'll end up they they have structured this property to get rid of. They planted a bunch of cactus and like stuff, so you can't even walk along the roads there. And there's only their guard shack there, and then you're technically on their property, so then they can call the police on you. It's very hard to protest in that location, but that is the actual location. Uh, where uh, Golden Era Productions is and formerly the international management was, but it's been most, mostly disbanded because David Miscavige is just in charge of everything on his own now. Um, but if you did want to know where those properties are, you can you can find them on Google Earth or anything. That is where also Bob Ferris is most likely being held. And yeah. um, Liz Ferris's Bob father, Ferris. and I worked with him for many years. He's a, he's a very nice man, but he's got to be very old at this point. I'm sure he's in his 70s. And... Um, I'd like, I'd like to see Bob out of there. Like I'd like to see all of our parents out of there. Yeah. So. My mom's still there right now. I'd like to see her out too. Yeah. Um, thank you, old Fritz. Yeah. Laura, thank you for not using the full W O G word. It's ugly as the N word here. And yeah, that I, I don't want to do that. Cause I'm very, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even going to well, get into it, but so yes, crazy. offensive and upsetting. I ask other creators say the W word. Exactly. W or I w just word. say, I say the, the wog just so people know um, what did yes, you see on you. i think on eric's channel he had some uh videos that uh somebody in the austin org because they're trying to open up this org down there had sent some of their internal recruiting videos the things are horrible they're like they're they wouldn't even do well on tiktok the, the production quality was such such utter garbage they were using that word in their videos for recruitment for the scientologists to try to get people to sign up for staff um yeah. and it the, the point being is it is still in active use. So even though that is, is very much is a slur, it is so much of the Scientology um, vernacular, part of their, their, you know, their, their everyday words that they're going to use that they cannot help themselves and they will use it all the time, even though it is so offensive. Mm -hmm. Just yep. horrible. They can't help themselves literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, Laura, when did you realize you had a choice in life? I'm still realizing it every day and I love it in every moment and every taste of food and every sip of alcohol and every smoke of marijuana and every breath of life, every bath I take, every good night of sleep, every joke that somebody makes me laugh about. I realize I have my choices in life now. So every day it's making me stronger and, and, and I hope everybody as well. 
question, Laura, do you feel so alive and free when you're out there protesting? Yes. And that's probably why people think I'm drunk or whatever they were saying. It's a freaking joy to watch it in full motion. Love to you both. Yes. It's so, uh, guys, it's so healing. It's so, it feels so relieving. You're just, you're just like, it's just, you're shutting down an organization right there in plain sight that used all the tricks that you were so used to doing me. I was so used to doing to other people that were on the outside. And now we're using language and words that I would have, it would have tripped me out if I heard some of this stuff. So being a Sea member. And so it's really cool to be able to know the whole thing and, and to be able to be the few that were born and raised in this and can really give advice to these, these awesome, you know, uh, I call them, I call them all journalists because we're all journal. We're all here documenting what's going on. That's the truth of it. And because if we don't document it and film it correctly, Scientology will spin it in a whole nother way because that's what they think is okay to do. They can do anything illegal as long as it's the greatest good for Scientology. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that's that. Okay, any more other things? Guys, we're going to wrap up soon. Aw, thank you for this sweet thing. I like Sterling, but I think he's a little bit on the denial about all parents because Serge was trafficked. Oh, yeah, Serge's traffic is just a fact. Yeah, and it's not... It, there's different ways for people to see things. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, um, there's different ways for... Sterling, if he was born literally in Italy and never, ever entered Scientology, he might see his the way that he was human traffic. This is about like, you don't have a choice. This is what you're doing. This is human trafficking. And then I'm going to use a religion and an organization above you that holds over your head that makes you feel like, OK, I am saving the world. So I must stay in this situation. This is completely the opposite of freedom. This is completely the opposite of what life is here for us to be and have and do. Like, and mm -hmm. so, and that's what Scientology is getting away with. So that's all I want to say about that is that, and there, yeah, and uh, and 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 not to put words in in Sterling's mouth, but we've we've had conversations about it, and he even and anyone like Sterling did one video, and I think it was uh, probably a, a, it. Some people took some of what he said. Um, because of the way he presented it um, the wrong way. And that's Sterling's responsibility. And he did a video the next day to go back and kind of address some of that. And he very, he very um, outright said he 100% believes that there is trafficking and was trafficking occurring in Scientology. So um, I think it would be worth anyone if, if they're interested in doing so, go look at some of Sterling's content. Um, and I, it's within the last week or so. And I think he does actually talk about this. Another thing, and just to, because uh, Sterling is a friend and I do want to um, just, you know, kind of uh, provide him a little bit of air cover with respect to how he's trying to cope with his own trauma. He is trying to look at something from his own perspective so that he can function as a little bit more on the optimistic side, trying to be loving and supportive of people that do not support uh, did, do not support or love him back in the way that he needs it and he's trying to do that in his own way to cope with the situation which unfortunately his biological father and the person that was his mother more than his own mother his whole time growing up has disconnected from him and refuses to talk to him that for him has got to be devastating so yeah. as everyone kind of has to move through this mess that we're like we were all put in this situation not because we totally. wanted to be here we were shoved into would, this shit. Like every one of us would, all when yeah, uh, in different ways. And and each person that's coping. So when Sterling went on and said, Hey, Serge's story is his, I need to not be critical of that. I think good for him for saying that. And I think he learned something from that. But I think as we're all doing this, and we're in a different category a little bit than the people that decided that they wanted to join this shit on their own, I think. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of say that all of us that were kind of like forced into this when we were children and made to work for this organization is different than me as a consenting adult that decided to do this or me as a consenting adult that was an executive in this organization deciding even though I knew illegal shit that was going on and I'm not saying that this is me I'm I'm speaking hypothetically if there was somebody that was in charge of the the things that were going on in the organization as a grown ass person that knew the truth in the world and all this sort of stuff and they still decided to be there that's a different kind of person than a kid that was like, 
completely had his world turned upside down, was undereducated and is now trying to find their place in the world as Laura is, as I am, as Serge mm -hmm. is, as many of us are that are in the same situation. Aaron, who somehow is just way more articulate than I will ever be. We're all in the same <laughs> situation as we were thrown into this shit when we were kids. Like no one asked us if we wanted to do this. I wasn't somebody, I wasn't walking down the street you know, and I, and without streets LA keeping people away. And I walked into that test center and said, Oh, this crazy right. shit really appeals to me. I was taking out the trash the other day. And I asked myself, would I have ever gotten into Scientology on my own? Like if like me, and no. I was like, and that's the only thing I was here. saying. That's the only thing I was saying about Sterling is like if Sterling was born in Italy or like I said, like a whole nother place, he would have a whole mm -hmm. different perspective, literally. So right, it, nobody's attacking anybody. I think it yeah. is very hard even for me to hear that my own father neglected me. Period. It's he did, whether I love him a lot, a lot or not. You know, I do. I love him a lot. But he neglected me. He neglected my brother. He's supporting the one other child in our family, Colleen, who's an outside Scientologist now. She was in this York. But like, it's just like, OK, you can clearly see where you're putting your quote unquote love or your attention and where you're not. And this is created only because of Scientology. If there was no law, even if my dad, if there was no law in Scientology to disconnect from people who are not interested or calling out Scientology for what it is. It obviously makes sense. We get it. It means it's going to break down the whole organization. So that's why we're doing it. So we get it. But it also is crazy um, that you have to, you're, you're, you're grooming people from childhood that it's a normal thing. Like, oh, well, you, you chose to leave. You chose to speak out. No, that's actually not a normal thing. It's not a normal thing just because somebody doesn't have the, uh, you know, same concept or agreements or re religious or political beliefs that their whole family just disconnects from them and stops talking to them because of that. No. So, yeah, you're always going to have in families um, differences in opinion. And it's like, you know what? I don't enjoy talking to aunt whoever. It's like every time we deal with each other, we can't stand it. Um, and then but that's that's an individual choice. But there's not an organization standing over you that says you will not do, you will not talk to these people anymore. So like that is the difference in this organization. And they they say that they are willing to talk to anybody about anything. And that's the benefit of being a Scientologist. You have think for yourself and you can talk to anybody about anything. You're the masters of communication. You can see how well that's working out. You get an SP out on the street. It's literally like you walk in L.A. somewhere and you turn on a light and all the cockroaches just go Bish! And they're just gone. Like, that's how it is. They cannot communicate. No one's answering questions. Right. You have to you have to trick them into answering a question. And then they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, okay, Which Ricky is exactly, Bobby, like, can you have a conversation? Anyway. That's exactly what happened with uh, Chris Chris without, without a Hellcat. He was asking mm -hmm. questions that internal Scientologists and Sea members didn't know that he was even being an outsider or a negative. He wasn't being positive. He was just being curious. Like, hey, right. oh, hi, I'm just walking down the street. Are you a Scientologist? And so they're kind of like, oh, yeah. Well, no, actually, my wife got me into it. And, so they're, and then all of a sudden, security's like, go inside. That's where they stop talking. Don't talk to them. Go inside. Mm -hmm. So they are asking really good questions. It's very pretty amazing I like, what's going I on. I liked on if one I of Aaron's If we videos. finish this, I'll go. I will be going out yeah. there tonight. Well, I can let you I can let you go here, Sandy. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, no, I'm not rushing <laughs> as you. I'm always take... the one taking way too long. I love when you're under I loved one of Aaron's questions. He's, he's like, hey, excuse me, I have a question. Everyone's being super nice. He's like, hey, I'm uh, doing a criminal video. You mind if I ask you some questions? He's like, hey, what do you think about Danny Masterson raping all those women? <laughs> I know that. Or they're like, um, hey, what's the most obvious thing about me? Which is such like a normal process that people do in Scientology on like a course of auditing, like learning how to audit people from the beginning. And so, so they think, oh, he's you... doing like a training drill. And then he's right. like, and what do you think about the Danny Masterson rape case? Do you, are you okay with like it's so funny? Oh, I remember love it. Um, one of the things that would be interesting for these things to do. You know how in in Scientology when you do the uh, when you do the tone scale drilling, and I think it's when you do the science or survival, you're supposed to go out and identify the different tone levels that a people have, and you go out there and you're supposed to do a survey. I don't. Did you ever do this where you actually go and you survey people, the WOGs in the real world and actually yeah. do this? You say, you what's the most obvious the thing scale? about me? Yeah. You say, yeah. what's the most obvious it's thing about me? Thank you. 
Uh, and they're like, and There's some other questions too. If we're, uh, do you think the world today is 50 years better than it was? There's some question like that. Do you think the world today has more advantage than it did 50, it did years, 50 ago? years ago? Something like yeah. that. It's so you just can to get like them talking get about in it. There. Yeah. Yeah. Just to break. They should that use ice. all those. But another thing that would be interesting is going to some of the local businesses around these areas and, and like doing surveys and say, like real surveys, and doing surveys and saying, like, do you hey, like Scientology? Have they harassed you? Is there anything going on with your business that, that would affect you if Scientology, mm -hmm. if you told 100%. Scientology, you didn't want them to be here. I thought about that. And I was like, maybe I'll do that even tonight on the street. Like yeah, maybe I'll say, do hey, that and know. even ask the TikTokers, but get a straight up question. What's your name? Chris. Good here. And, and slide like, you know, but having real people say right off the bat, my percentages of being on Hollywood Boulevard, asking these questions was 100% this or 80% this, or I don't care. I don't mm -hmm. know much about them. Like at least we could just, just ask them, Hey, have you heard about people. Scientology? Have, what, what have you heard there. about Scientology? What, you know, or just ask right. people, Hey, would you ever consider going into a Scientology organization and inquiring more about it? Like, I mean, and just get like what normal people right. think that are yeah. not Scientologists. Yeah, um, I think that, I wonder that if would the, be I wonder if the LAPD would do any survey stuff if you'd actually answer, ask them questions. They, but they, that'd probably be getting in their way. Those, they have, no, they have a very hard job to do. LA, I don't know. No, LAPD is very corrupt. They will not on the record say that they are Anything. not for Scientology. No, they will not say mm -hmm. that, even if they're not. Yeah. They know what's going on. They know the corrupt. They know what happens when Scientology called. They know all of it. They know. And and now they're getting it even more, even for the new, you know, the new cops coming on and stuff. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. I think what we're doing is great. Somebody asked earlier, I might have missed it, but like they said, how long um, do you think it will take until, you know, we close on that? We don't know. We can't predict anything. But right now what everybody's doing and all mm -hmm. of us talking about this stuff on our channels and the protesting and everything we're planning and making people be accountable, like filing lawsuits against David Miscavige and Church of Scientology and things like this. That's that's the thing that is going to. The time that, so aside from those legal things that I talked about, uh, abuse of children, abuse of the elderly, and basically financial crimes, those are the things that are legally going to deal with Scientology. And another thing that you can do is if you talk to your state representatives, and if you're able to talk to a state senator, and you can say, hey, the Scientology you know, explain to them the situation, go over, you know, what's going on. The fact that they're a tax exempt organization that is a for profit activity. The Supreme Court denied their tax exempt status and said, hey, this is a for, uh, you know, a, a pay as you go activity. It does not qualify for 501c3 tax exempt status. Individual citizens speaking out and saying, I'm not cool with this because literally they 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 are everyone who's paying taxes is supplementing Scientology. They are able to get all of the benefits of the society without paying into the society. So that is not good. And they're not the, for a person or an entity, um, like a nonprofit or a, a religious organization to have tax exemption, they have to prove that they provide a a public benefit that would offset cost that would otherwise have to be provided by the government. Scientology does not provide shit. So they're not actually doing any of those things. So individual citizens speaking out and doing something, the individual conversations, people t making it a priority to do something about it, um, or just getting on the bandwagon with other people and, you know, doing what you can with it, doing petitions, you know, sending letters. These are all things that as an individual citizen, if you're interested in doing something, you can make a difference in your local area. And that will change public perception, which will then change what is referred to as public policy, the way that the society views what is OK and what is not OK. And then that is able to then um, affect the legal arena as well. I think. Yep. <laughs> yep, 100%. And there's a lot of these people, like Aaron will talk about it on his and people that are out on the streets and on, you know, doing these things, they'll, they'll mention the numbers and the phone numbers to call and, and email and say, hey, this is not okay, like for LAPD, you know, he puts out the LAPD, uh, Streets LA is always shouting out, what's your seer, what's your email, so people can email them and they can email um, their captain and things like that and be like, this is not okay. This, Oh, and as long as we keep doing, they're going to keep seeing this and it's going to put pressure period on them to start disconnecting themselves from Scientology, disassociating because we'll see how well Scientology tries to cover up all its crimes without that support, without that backup from the LAPD and all that. Absolutely.
Uh, you did you guys from Knit Pearl? Uh, did you guys get paid as kids, Mike? How much did you? What was the most you got paid as a cadet? And then how much was the most you got paid as a C or or as a Gold Staff member? So I think as cadets we either got and and uh, I might be a little off on this. Maybe ten dollars was does that sound about right? I think it was either ten. It was and and then once you became a full staff member it was about just short of 46 it was about 46 dollars and change of what you would actually get because of course they got to take taxes out of it so that you can you know pay in on the on the taxes that you need to do so um when we would be and th and that's when we got paid a lot of times the last thing that gets covered is staff pay um they need to keep the electrical they they've already reduced down the kind of food that you're eating down to the lowest potential level the the uh the the California penal system spends more money per meal to um, provide food for inmates than Scientology does for <laughs> its. Staff wow. Members. That's a good point. I didn't even, yeah, that's right. Cause I learned more. about, yeah. I learned about the whole, it's actually, you know, costs money to keep people in prison and then it's very expensive. Wow, yeah. I just muted myself. Um, so yeah, there you go. Oh, I was going to say on the pay, the kit, the Int ranch cadets, uh, it was 10, but then it got lowered to $7. Hmm. And that's if you were, uh, you know, a, a upstat cadet, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Let's be honest. The difference between 7 and 10, you're basically not getting anything. Like, <laughs> well, as a if, cadet, if that I was lose a lot $10, more like it's, licorice and tiger milk bars. That's true. Three bucks is a lot of junk food, uh, especially back in the day, 20 years ago. But what did we have to reflect on? All we knew as junk food or the store was our canteen from the outside world. That's the only way we would get treats is from our parents or I call them treats still. It's from our parents on Sunday. They would bring whatever they would bring like, oh, fun. And some of that would even get confiscated like, oh, you can't have this Tiger milk bar has too much sugar or uh, yeah, like Lauren Hollander bringing all your sugar cookies that can't you know what i mean like so stuff would get deciphered and taken away from us even as personal packages from our out from from a non-scientologist family members and sea org members like if you were sending your daughter a package of cute things that you thought she could have the enrich i mean now you would know because you were a kid there but if you were like some of the stuff from your for your daughter that you were sending her would get taken away and she wouldn't be able to tell you about it either because it might interbulate you yeah very, very much information control and the kids would get in trouble if they'd say something. It's true. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, we're wrapping it up soon. So if you have any of the last little questions, oh, hi, Serge Del Mar. I see you. Hey, Serge. We see you. We love you. Or I love you. I don't know if Mike loves you, but I love you. So I've never talked to Serge. Um, the couple of times that I've been out there, I've, I mean, we've just never crossed paths, but it would be fun to, I'm sure, I'm sure in the future, as things progress, uh, Serge and I will have some conversations and I'm sure I'll enjoy them. Yes, you will very much. In fact, you guys would have eloquent, beautiful conversations, like unbelievably. What can I say? Question B C E B. Why am what Betsy you? It reminds me of this sushi place. Betsy you. Okay. Question. Can I, what can I say to, Yes, Senator, when there is 0% Scientology presence in my state. So what you can do is a lot of these senators, um, for instance, in, in the legislature, when they're making the laws and passing the bills and all this sort of stuff that uh, that fund the government, there's a group called the Ways and Means Committee that go over how the money is being spent. So people that are on that committee, even if they don't have a Scientology presence in that state, they're still talking about and working out how allocations are happening and where the government is spending its money and spending its time. So for an organization such as Scientology to have tax exempt status, that is lost revenue for the country overall, not and for the state specifically as well. So if you just approach it from the financial loss perspective of an organization that is having their people pay for services and it is not providing a public good that has tax exemption is something that should be reviewed, uh, should 100% be reviewed. And that would benefit like the, the inflation across the United States if there was more money coming in potentially. And that's just something that they could 100% do regardless of if they have a Scientology presence or not. Because I'll tell you, as I've traveled around this country, like there's there's a bullshit little small Scientology presence in Hollywood that's getting a lot of attention. There's the stuff in Clearwater where they've taken it over, but it doesn't really exist very much in the world. Like Scientology is a household word for the exact reason that they don't want to be. 
Um, so the word is getting out and they're going to slowly keep shrinking. And it wasn't for these big whales giving them money. They would already be gone, I think. So what yeah. do I know, right? Yeah. What do we know? We were in a born and raised in a cult. What can be done immediately to free the people still in the cult of Scientology prison compounds? Mike, what do you think would be, look, like I have an SP sign, obviously, as y'all know from, from Rolling Stones, just kidding. <laughs> um, what would, and I say proud SP because even when I first wrote this and I'm still proud of it, I'm very proud of the sign and what it means um, because it really does make people internally that see it. Uh, in the Sea Org and people outside ask, what's SP? They always ask me that. So that immediately lets me explain exactly what disconnection is and family disconnection is and what they call me, right? And how they yeah. put out a thing like, Laura does drugs and she's a, you know, whatever they put out and say on these things, like, which is insane, you guys. I literally am the, the, the cleanest, coolest, calmest rock star. I am a wild rock star, so I am fun and wild and loud, but- I don't do your crazy drugs, guys. I don't do that. I don't do. I've never touched C-O-C-A-I-N-E in my life. I've never I, I've never touched the H. I've never done anything like that. And when I do, it's a little bit of fun when I'm out in the desert and I purposely am trying it to see how I feel and what I can heal or do from it. So these idea that just because I'm loud and wild and crazy, uh, uh, get your guys's head straight. My head is pretty straight and I am wild and loud, but anyways, back to the sign. So, what sign would you put? So, um, I'd have to figure out what sign I'm not, I'd have to give it some thought to, uh, come up with a good answer. But so the protesting and everything that's being done, that, that is very important. But at this point, we are guarding people from getting into Scientology and supporting protests. And when you're doing that, you're keeping, you're keeping this, this people on the outside safe from getting involved in something that is potentially going to ruin them. Um, the people that are in there are very deeply indoctrinated and they will leave at some point on their own when their living conditions are so terribly bad or uh, that they everyone has a breaking point and well, you just can't put up with enough crap anymore. And David Miscavige is a master at being a complete and total D-I-C-K. At some point, that um, his ability to lead in his way will trickle down and people will get pushed out of the organization. When they do, people need to understand that there is a safe landing area for them when they get out here. There are people that love them. There are people that care about them. There are organizations. The Aftermath Foundation exists. There are other foundations that are going to be created that are here to help people as they come out of these destructive cult of Scientology so that they can come out and actually... Um, get reintegrated into society. And that is going to take a lot of work. But I think that the protesting is important on its own, but that's to keep people out. The people that are in the protesting doesn't do anything in order to benefit those people. If anything, it might even keep them in there, but it will lay in seeds of like, the world doesn't like us. Why not? I thought right. all this is great. What is right. going on? So it'll, it'll make them internalize and ask questions, even if the questions are almost subconscious to them, but eventually they will want to leave. And that's where, you know, like the people that are in there, the, so that the, the security guards that are coming out, like the people that are out there doing the body routing and stuff like that, be pleasant and all these sort of things, but say, Hey, um, and for people that are concerned, if I'm not saying the word D-I-C-K or not, I'm trying to keep it clean here. Okay. Come on. Um, but <laughs> yes, I think David Miscavige to. is a huge dick. He is 100% a dick. Uh, and if it, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's, it's Richard, you know, Richard, uh, Richard Cranium, like he's a, is a dickhead. So um, in case there is any question, if I can actually say it or not, I 100% can, but the protesting is important. And um, the, it's important that we get the word out on this stuff um, to yeah. uh, help people not get in there. And then when they do leave, um, be respectful of them. Like they're a lot of them, they, they have a, a reality that's been distorted and you need to, you know, be willing to help them ease back into society and realize that it's not all bad out here, which it isn't. It's great. No, it's totally great. Even like we're spending our time to heal from the ungreatness. So that means it's pretty great mm -hmm. out here to be able to have choice, to be able to go to therapy and heal and do all this and have a channel and everything like Right. Uh, okay, Marla Dillard said, oh, hi, Husky lover. I love hu people with Huskies and Husk because I have a Husky. Okay, question, don't the insiders wonder where is LRH? What do you think about that, Mike, about 
about the was it because LRH did you did you feel like in the Sea Org that LRH was coming back? Did you hear about the gold announcement that twenty years from a certain point he was going to come back to gold so, base or something? Um, I think in in general the Scientology public are not under the impression that L. Ron Hubbard is ever coming back. I think to the Scientology right. public, they have been fed a line where L. Ron Hubbard has, he left his body, he went on to do this upper level research that he didn't need his body for to go do all of his space alien stuff. And he is then on the next planet trying to, you know, seed Scientology in on the next thing, which they refer to as Target 2. And that yeah, is, I, was, I think, the, the thing that has been fun, spun for all the Scientologists. Up at the highest levels... I think at some point, David Miscavige was probably unsure if Hubbard was going to come back or not. I see him as a person that like is drinking the Kool-Aid and like at the same time, he has access to all of the crazy to probably realize that there's no actual upper OT levels that exist. And he's left trying to figure out what to do with this stuff. So they spend all that money to make... <coughs> that big mansion for Hubbard. They have all of the, like they, they worship him now. I think at one point they were almost thinking he was going to come back and then the dude didn't show. So oops. Uh, great to see you, Laura and Mike. Hi, blow drill. Hi. Uh, if you like the conversation, hey. like their pages and subscribe. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, honey. And did you see this one I put up while you're <clears throat> mm, love it? Hashtag David Miscavige to jail 2024. I love that. <laughs> That's a good sign. That's a good yeah, sign to walk for around. sure. Yes. Or ooh, what about a sign? Get out. Get out. Get out now. Or uh get, get out, out while you still can. While you still can. <laughs> it's never I like too that late. David to jail like that. 2024. It's, yeah, that was great. Great one. Question, Ellie said, I am talking about the people held in their prisons. How do we f how do we free them now? I am afraid that you can't. You cannot free anybody that's on the RPF and stuff like that. There's no way. There's no way. And you cannot <clears throat> free underage auditors that are auditing or, you know, auditors that were once underage and now they're 23, 24. You can't free them. They're auditing. They're making the money. They're paying. They are doing the work that uh, justifies the the money intake of this laundering organization and the human yeah. trafficking and all that so uh watch the uh documentary scientology and the prison of belief because really what you have there is a group and an organization that is so um indoctrinated that they will continue to be there no matter what and they think that that is the best thing that they can do with regard to the rpf that similar to the children was becoming such a problem that they have ca stopped calling it the rehabilitation project force. And now what they're doing is they're taking their staff members that are in trouble and they're just putting them in a lower organization that is in charge of still doing manual labor. They'll still have like these uh, gr like these uh, correction programs for them to do where they'll get the sec checking and all that. They're just not calling it the RPF the same way anymore because of the reasons um, that have been shared in a lot of these videos, that it is a, a serious uh, legal problem for the way that they were treating all these people. So what Scientology is very good at, um, like for instance, Office of Special Affairs, that is their, their uh, dirty tricks organization. It used to become the Guardian's office. Then they got caught doing a big infiltration of the government. A bunch of them went to jail, including L. Ron Hubbard's wife. So they just changed the names on everything. They changed all of the letterhead. They changed the topies of the policy letters, stopped calling it Guard Guardian's office's bulletins. They started calling Office of Special Affairs orders or bulletins. It's the same crap. It's just like one of these... Like in, in deployments, you would have these defense contractors. It's like, oh, Blackwater gets in trouble. Then they come back and they're a new, and they just reincorporate as different things. Scientology is the same way. So whatever organizations you see now are the same bullshit organizations from back in the day that are doing the same dirty tricks that were that they were doing before. It's the same stuff. But they they're 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 trapped in there in the fact that all their information, their behavior, their thoughts are all controlled. Um and to such a degree that they 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 are the they are prisoners, but they could just walk out the door if they really wanted to, but they just don't think they can. Um, it's almost like a, a shelter animal. If you open the door and it would stay in its crate and it didn't think it could go out into the real world, that's a Scientologist that's working in the C organization. <clears throat> yep, you're right over there. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I'm just coughing away my little Mary Jane. Uh, leaving Scientology is the way to happiness. That would be a great sign. So, you know, those cu uh, custom way to happiness books where you could get your face put on them and stuff like that. You can get your own way to happiness books. printed. Oh, if we can God. get some SPTV way to happiness books printed like happy, or, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, streets, LA, a little bit of, uh, all, all the different creators. I mean, I have a merch, I'm, I'm, books. I have a printing person who, I mean, streets LA has already got some shirts. So like, even by the time my printing person said, Oh, I'll get some shirts for streets. He's like already, they got some hoodies with all their faces. It's just hilarious. So good job. The it's more, funny. the merrier, as long as everybody's being beautiful and loving and don't do anything to like attack Scientology, you can film and do everything. Don't do anything immature and illegal period. But yeah, ask whatever you want and film whatever you want and stay on the property lines of wherever you can be. And because just through that, you're going to help expose the internal inside out. I do mm -hmm. like this, though. Sure. Leaving Scientology is I should maybe backwards. It should say the way to happiness because that would attract attention. What the way to happiness? They'd look at the sign and then and then right below would say is leaving Scientology. Mm -hmm. or leaving the sea or, org. that would be or surge one. said one down here get out before y'all get indicted <laughs> is a good okay, one that's or another better. one is is uh call the <laughs> fbi for witness protection uh anyway maybe that's an option too yes <laughs> get out before y'all get indicted that yeah but i think they wouldn't know the outside laws so i'm thinking they'd be like indicted for what i've been doing my receptionist job all day <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh thank you mandy for modding always whenever you can do it so much love thank you darling angel baby and thank you guys for being in the chat i see you all i can't pull up everybody but i see you all and thank you for all the new people that are here on mike's channel and stuff like that we're gonna keep doing these wrestling rounds and i feel like this round mike was a lot better maybe our next uh round rest, rest we'll we'll have two like you know wrestling gloves so boxing gloves will yeah, they'll be no, like, yeah, Mike good. and Laura are still fighting. <laughs> no, this, I think, uh, I'm glad we did this. Um, if nothing else, I mean, it's just showing that, hey, two people that um, had a beef, um, even if, you know, I didn't see it that way and uh, at first, and then I realized like, oh, shit, there's somebody that has a problem with me. I think it's important, like, hey, if there's somebody that, like, uh, deal with it straight on. I mean, what do you have to lose? The only reason you wouldn't do something like that is if you actually do have something to lose because you've done something so terribly bad um, that you couldn't do it. The, I'll say that for maybe some of the more senior people that probably have more to lose uh, from that. But the people that are all in the same category as us, as as people are able to, even if they're not doing it like live, like Laura and I have decided to do, we're two people that love the own, uh, are the sound of our voices independently and we can just get on here and talk and we don't mind doing that. I know that might not work for everybody, but if you guys need to talk to each other, like if you mm -hmm. have a problem with somebody, if you're able to pick up the phone, fire them a text and say, hey, can we carve out a little time where we can, you know, you know, have a productive conversation. I think uh, it, we we owe each other that much um, because we were 100%. never granted that much when we were there. So I, I and would they're and they're not it. giving and they're not giving us permission. We're giving ourselves permission to do this, and it feels so cool. It felt yeah. weird because yeah, the last time we knew each other, we were in the Sea Org, and we had like all these rules and and superior issues and everything. So. That's literally yeah. the last time we spoke and then we decide, okay, well, let's do this live stream. Uh, and I was, I thought I was prepared for it. I thought I was stronger than I am today now and, and more healed. And now I love you, Mike. And I think you're precious and you're so great. And like I said, you're one of the few who's actually come and spoken on your behalf on it. And then also being like your life now. And it's such a great, our example, our actions, us talking and telling our life stories and me being fun and not being offended by anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm living my life now. It's amazing guys. So this is the outcome. Yeah. And that's what I want people to know. And we should definitely do round three. And I think round three, I'm going to also have some pictures and some other fun things that will be actually more interesting, not interesting, but more on the lighter side, even though people in the chat might find them very effed up because like yeah, we, we said, it, we found fun in doing construction and things like that. So I have a bunch of pictures where we could bring up a lot cool. of fun things like that and yeah, fire like break, that. And I, all kinds of things. Well, I appreciate you too, Lauren. And I know you're going through, we're all going through our journey on this. And I know that that is something that we all have to do. 
So um, good for you for going out there and figuring it out. And again, all of us, uh, both the creators and also the people that are taking the time to watch our videos, look, we're doing this without a safety net most of the time. Most of us, you know, we're barely qualified to drive a car. So have a little <laughs> compassion. Somebody's stupid enough to let me fly a so let to stupid enough to let me fly a helicopter. But hey, the government's a crazy thing. But I'm just saying that as we're doing this, just realize like, hey, we're I would not, let we're you. I mistakes. would let you fly me. I would let you fly me in a helicopter. Maybe we can fly in well, a helicopter over the ranch. That would be incredible. <laughs> would be something. And we can um, film I, it on live stream. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, some of the footage from that. Uh, uh, the German news crew of the, the overhead filming that they did. I'll send yeah. you the links for it. I'm actually, I'm actually one of the I bad guys in that video. Oh, okay. I want to, I want to see, I don't have, I was one of the, up. I was one of the guys filming the film the... crew. There was anyway. That oh, would, that'd be fun to... okay. Yeah. And was this part of the film where Marty, uh, Martin Hobshite was on the tractor blocking the road with the, yeah. The and then, yeah. Okay. And you know how I probably they, saw this a the while PIs? ago. Yeah. Yeah. So there were the PIs on that. And I know people are like, what is he talking about? But there was a yeah. German news crew that went out there trying to film the RPF when it was out at that the ranch property where the kids were. And they yeah. flew over the property and they were trying to go out there and film it um, because there was a uh, a German citizen that was out there by the name of Vipka Hansen. And she was one of the senior Scientologists in uh, Germany for a while. And then she had been moved out there anyway. As this film crew was there, they blocked the road with a tractor. The uh, public relations guy, Ken Hoden, was up there, like, you know, telling him to get off the property and all this. This was shortly after I was reindoctrinated and not let to leave. And I, I had literally became like a little ver their version of, I don't know, to, you know, kind of stepping outside of my lane of comfort, almost like Hitler youth, like you're going to do whatever you're told kind of thing. And this is the, the position that I'm in. And this is probably the mic that Laura remembers. I'm one of the people taking pictures Yes, getting in you the were face the one of who the news crew. Were able, yeah, this is why, guys. Like, I, I'm not going back to mean Mike because Mike is a freaking sweetheart, and I can't wait to physically give you a good solid hug so we can be fully healed. Uh, I appreciate no, you too, Laura. but um, I this is one of the little things that we haven't talked about, so we'll we'll do this in round three because a lot of this stuff will come up the German reporters and all this, but these were one of the things that I'm like so. Uh, does Mike remember that like he used to have this huge presence of like, I, I don't know if you were big and strong and stocky, but in my eyes you were and you would like you and Mike Norton and some other people would just go and be like strong enough to be calm, but solid, like a solid bull. And you still have this appeal today, which in the outside world is really awesome and and kind of like a cool, you know, whatever a cool, like strong well, benefit. We, but, but, we but like to me, it felt like you were scary. School. Right. You were able to, you were the one that was always doing the intruder drills on with us and teach, like you were always there. It just felt like, okay, he could wrong. beat the F mm -hmm. out of somebody if he had to. And that, and, and in a, a child's eyes to think that somebody could get rid of somebody almost to the degree of murder, but you've never seen them do it but you've seen them just be enforcing this. It just feels like the biggest fear. So there was a lot that I was getting over, I guess. <laughs> when I first. Yeah, I would say so. That's a lot. Um, well, I would say, imagine if you had a military academy for kids and you sent them all to it and you didn't break them down by classes and ages and they were all just lumped in together. And you did that not like, because there are military academies for like, kids that finish high school and they go into college and they go to a military academy and they pop out the other side and they're a military officer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a military school where all the kids were like shoved in together and there was no proper supervision or structure for it. And the kids were made to be the structure. And that was the position that I felt. So Scientology has a word for that. They call it ethics presence. And ethics presence is supposed to be a very virtuous thing in Scientology. If you are showing ethics presence, you're showing that you have the willingness, the determination, the structure to follow orders and get things done. And that was what was expected of us. And I can honestly say that I was trying to be the best I could at that. And I see now how absolutely intimidating that could be, especially as I'm, you know, a, a 16, 17, 18 year old kid becoming an adult working with other children that are like eight years old. Like I wouldn't put my kids in that situation. And I hate that I was then in that situation. And and also the there were the threatened, 
even when you weren't there for years, there would be a threat. Like if anybody ever blows, oh, well, then they're going to have to. It would be like if they're gone for more than 24 hours, if one of the kids were gone for more than 24 hours, then they're going to have to notify gold security. That was like, oh, that's already a big flap. But then if they're gone for a day or two or they need reinforcements, they would bring back Mike Brown and people that were at the Ant Ranch. Or they would have Mike Brown come with other people that were other like executives of the Sea Org and then would leave Mike Brown there for a day or two or whatever it was. It just felt like forever. And then these standards were left being upheld there. Like, So it just got really strict and hard. And it wasn't like, obviously... Look, it was like that. Like you just said it. You were trying to be mm-hmm. the best. You were trying to be the like this is how you guys stay in line and this is what you should, well, you know. Not not so in my defense, sense. but just in an answer for how a person gets to that point. What happens if I'm not like that? What happens to me if I'm not like that? Right. I right. what I trouble become, do you get in at sex right. checking? So, yeah. So you either you either fall in line with the way the organization wants you to be or you become you become the thing you or you fall into the side of that, which you're fearful of. Um, I, I can't encourage this enough. And that's kind of why my channel is called Mike Brown 101. Anyone who hasn't read the book 1984, they have as part of it when they finally catch not trying to give it away. But there's people that are trying to think for themselves in this very dystopian jacked up society that's all very tightly controlled by the government. And finally, when it's to the point where uh, they, the person gets caught and they're, they're in thought reconditioning and they will bring them to this room, which is room 101, and they will recondition their thoughts. And they will say, you know, they'll say nonsense words that don't make any sense. Like, you know, uh, one plus two or one plus one equals four. And the person's like, no, it doesn't. And they'll like, they'll torture them until they agree that whatever nonsense they're saying They'll break the person down, but then they do it with other information till the person just agrees. That is what Scientology indoctrination does through all of the different uh, security checking and thought reconditioning and stuff that they do. They get you to break down reality and agree on whatever they tell you to or else the like the torturous activities will continue. So I call my my uh, my channel Mike Brown 101 kind of for that reason, but also I was in the 101st Airborne, so it just sounds like there's a double whammy on that one so anyway um i'll have to figure out uh somebody said hey you should make a patch or something i'm like i don't think i'm gonna be a merch oh, guy but yeah matthew anyway, matthew <laughs> hi matthew hi cc hi everybody but matthew yes matthew asked i didn't know what that meant a loop and a he said a loop and a hook? so hook and pile uh, so oh. the military, uh, so Velcro, everyone knows what Velcro is, right? That is a trademarked <laughs> company that owns Velcro. I love Velcro. So the, yeah, Velcro is great. So you know how we have the patches and stuff on our uniform and you can even have morale patches where you can have like a funny little right. thing and sometimes people put it on their bags. Well, mm-hmm. the military didn't want to pay Velcro for all of the Velcro crap that is all over our stuff. So they had another manufacturer make it and they refer to it as hook and pile. The pile is the fuzzy part and the hook is the the hard part. So hook and pile is Velcro. But you can't oh. say Velcro because that's a trademark thing that's owned by a company. So the military refers to oh, it as hook and pile. Oh, that's so funny. That anyway. is so interesting. I watched a game show one time and they said, in what year? Something about Velcro. And there was a whole talk about that. And I was like, oh, that's good to know yeah. about Velcro, that it's its own company or its own name. Like it's actually Velcro mm-hmm. is trademarked as Velcro. Like uh, Every compact disc, like the, the, and this is another little thing of uh, trivia, compact discs not only know this because we we're manufacturing them in Golden Era Productions, but the, the trade, or the actual like a patent for compact disc is owned by the Philips company. So every single compact disc that ever got produced, they had to pay royalties to Philips for that compact disc because they, Philips owned the trademark for it, even if it was another company making it. So, so Velcro in that way, if somebody used Velcro, they would then have to pay royalties to Velcro. Anyway, that's fun. That's see guys learning and loving. <laughs> Doesn't matter what we talk about. We'll be learning and loving on all aspects. Yeah. See, that was a total misdirect. She's like, you were mean to me as a kid and all this stuff and a, a total tyrant. Well, let me let you talk to you about and Velcro. Let's talk about Velcro. Uh, <laughs> I love that guys. Well, on that Velcro, we know, uh, if there's any more questions, guys, save them for our next one. We'll do round three, Mike and Lara FM. Um, love to you all. Yes. Sweet dreams. You guys, thank you all for being here. Mike, we did a pretty good long chat, two hours and 20 minutes. 
Yeah, it was good. Thanks everyone who stuck around. Uh, replay crew, I appreciate y'all. Uh, again, if anyone's on my channel and they haven't subscribed to Laura, which is highly unlikely at this point because I'm pretty sure you're the bigger name and all this sort of stuff, but please do her oh. the honor of going over there and uh, uh, showing her. And some go love, to Mike's uh, channel and we're and learn about flights and militaries and him leaving gold base and learning life from the freaking insanity yeah. of the gold base and growing up at the Ant ranch. That is just crazy. And, and it's your really mother, uh, and your mother, and maybe on the, can we also say that maybe on the next, uh, round three that we do, uh, can, we can have a little bit of, uh, questions answered or voice notes from your mom or whatever. Maybe if we, we can, do something I'm like that. Try to I'm getting some gear and stuff so that I can hopefully get some uh, recordings with my mom. She's not going to be able to come on here and do all this crazy crap with us. But what I can do is actually <laughs> sit down with her, and maybe record something where she could share some stuff. So I thought that might be fun for her to talk a little bit about uh, because she knew you when you were little and you guys chat now yeah. and stuff. So um, maybe get some of her thoughts on that. And then maybe if you wouldn't mind, have her talk a little bit about your parents just from her yeah. thoughts. Yep. I think that would be so that, perfect. We can talk about it. Yeah, and that would be really fun and cute. And thanks, Ellie. And she probably it. even has more of a per perspective, even just being out, even the month or two that she has been out. Like now she has even more to be like, oh, and this and this. Like I can't even imagine. So, yeah, so that would be you, really cool. Before I do that, I'll get some thoughts from you so I can, you know, if you have specific questions and things you'd like for her to talk about, you know, we can see Perfect. if we can get that I'll together. I'll text you them. I think it'd be good. That'll be so cool. cute, guys. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to sub, Ellie, just sub to you. Don't forget to sub thank to you. Mike Brown. He's he's up on there. He just said Mike Brown 101. And then if you're not subscribed to mine, do it. But if not, oh, guys, I did hit 5,000 subscribers. So I should be like Congratulations. doing a whole thing. And, but you know what? I do love it. I really appreciate it. I'm not going to get wild, but I love and appreciate it so much. And um, I can't wait till we have you know, everybody watching everybody. It's going to be perfect. And it's, it's already awesome. what's happening, right? <laughs> All right, Mike. One love you. Talk to you soon. And right, yeah, Laura. exactly. One day at a time. Bye. Bye, guys. See you on Hollywood streets tonight. If you're out there oh, yeah, protesting against Scientology, I might go live. I might not, but I'll be out there tonight. See and I'll be here with a snowstorm. Bye. Yes. Protect the snow. <laughs> Protect the snow. <laughs> Bye. Thank <laughs> you.